Good afternoon, everyone viewing from home. Today is Wednesday, May 27th, 2020. My name is Vivian Malaulu, and I would like to call the regularly scheduled meeting of the Long Beach Community College District Board of Trustees to order. The time is 432. For everyone tuning in to watch at home via YouTube or Zoom or whatever technology you are using, we welcome you. This is our third meeting. Uh, just as a reminder that uh, Governor Gavin Newsom did loosen some of the Brown Act um, stipulations that allow for us to be able to hold these meetings remotely. And we have had a few meetings uh, this way. So uh, pardon us in advance for any possible, we hope not, but maybe technical difficulties and uh, be patient with us. Thank you to our technology team uh, for uh, being able to make this happen for us. At this time, I would like to ask Madam Secretary to please take roll. Virginia Baxter. Here. Vivian Malaulu. Here. Udawak Joe Ntuk. Here. Doug Otto. Here. And Sunny Zia. Here. Thank you. Uh, item 1.3 on the agenda. Do we have any public comments on closed session items? Yes, board president, we have one um, that we would uh, read out to you. And it is from Dr. Janae Hund, the LBCCFA chief negotiator. Good evening, board president Malaulu, board president, vice, board vice president Enta, board of trustees, interim superintendent president Luann Bynum. Vice Presidents and Administrators, Faculty, Staff, Students, and Community. I would like to provide a comment on the closed session item 1.5, which is LBCCFA negotiations. As LBCCFA Chief Negotiator, I wish to convey that we have placed all our proposals on the table. We have worked collegially and cooperatively with the district's team. We have shared our research with the district and with the trustees. The research warrants the financial proposals we have put forward, namely on this on schedule salary increases, including an additional increase for faculty on step 20, as well as increases to our hourly faculty pay, overload and intercession pay, as well as parity with AFT and management in our retiree benefits. I have also viewed on the agenda another closed session item, uh, session agenda item 1.6, labor negotiations with the interim superintendent, President Bynum, and an open session item presumably on this topic, 5.1, extending her contract and increasing the salary. LBCCFA would also like nothing more than to arrive at a three-year renewed contract awaiting fair and equitable agreement from the district per your direction. Trustees, we have heard many positive references to faculty efforts this spring in our transition to remote instruction. Now is the time for action. On behalf of LBCCFA, I implore you to provide the parameters to the district's negotiating team that would land us a fair and equitable contract now so that we may focus on further professional development by preparing for online instruction this fall. We have provided ample evidence to the district as to how to fund our proposals, including cost savings from not hiring faculty per the FON obligation, COLA not filtered to LBCCFA the past three years, CARES Act monies, FEMA reimbursement for COVID-19, CalSTRS and CalPERS employer reduction contributions, considerable savings to the district if a SERP is offered and LBCC reserves for this rainy day. The faculty are watching and awaiting your positive direction Sincerely, Dr. Janae Hunt. And that is the only comment that we received. Thank you to Dr. Hunt on behalf of LBCCFA for submitting that comment. And thank you, Board Secretary Jackie Hahn for reading that. Uh, item 1.4 on the agenda, uh, we are going to discuss a conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, grievance of Article 10, under and pursuant to Education Code 87610.1. Would anybody care to open that discussion? That's for closed session, are we? That's, 
Yes, that's close that's second. Close session. Oh, I'm sorry. I um, I apologize. I'm reading the notes. Uh, I'm reading through the agenda, and not that we need to adjourn to closed session. I apologize for that. So um, we we do have three items on the agenda for closed session. We have item 1.3. Excuse me, 1.4, which is the one that I just read. Item 1.5, LBCC FA negotiation items pursuant to government code section 3549.1 and 54957.6, update with district chief negotiator, Jean Duran. And, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. The page just keeps on going. We have two more. Item 1.6, this is what happens when I've got three different laptops going on. Item 1.6, conference with labor negotiator, negotiation item pursuant to government code section 3549.1, 54957.6, 54954.5, district designated representative, Jean Duran, unrepresented employee, interim superintendent president. And then item 1.7, anticipated litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9D2, Conference with legal counsel, Alvarez, Glassman, and Colvin, one case. For um, the benefit of the public, there are some attachments on the agenda that are available for public view and some which are considered executive content. Uh, any additional discussion before we move to closed session? All right, we will be back. We will uh, return hopefully as close to 5.30 as possible and hopefully we will have um, all of the closed session items completed. Excuse me, uh, Board President Malapulu, I believe yes. uh, per Vince Ewing, attorney, that you have a, something to read out before you recess to closed session. Is that correct? Yes, and I did send you that email today. Uh, it's actually in the executive content under 1.7. Let's see. So I have to apologize because I've got too many electronic devices here. And I did have that open. Uh, if you have your board docs open, it's in executive content or it's on the copy that I sent, emailed you last night. So I just accidentally closed what you sent me last night and I'm trying to reopen it. And of course it's going slow. Is there, um, Vincent, is there any way that you uh, can... President Malalulu, it might be on the next page of the agenda. Let's at see. the top of the page. She said she closed it. No, it's oh, okay. no, I've got the different agenda. Stand by for one second. Let me try to open up the email I had last night, Jackie. Okay. okay. I'm gonna try to email you the so I had it open, but when I closed the closed session comment, it closed that one. Let's see. Okay, here it is. Ah, nope, that's not it. Jackie, I think I've gotten 30 emails from you in the last 24 hours. You probably have. <laughs> Let's see. And, and that's not all. <laughs> if I forward it to you through uh, your phone. Yeah, if you forward it to me right now, it'll be the first one on the list. And it's highlighted, so. Um, all right, did you just send it? Uh, just one moment. <laughs> And my board docs is open, but I don't have the highlighted that I'm supposed to read. Just sent to you only, and it's from um, Vince Ewing. Okay, I got it. And if you scroll down, make sure all the content is open on your phone, then it should be down highlighted there. Got it. Okay. So, um, the Board of Trustees will adjourn to closed session to discuss anticipated litigation regarding allegations pertaining to former President Superintendent Reagan Romali. And I believe that's the only statement. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, my apologies for that. I actually could probably memorize that. I thought I would be reading more. Okay, it is 441 and we are adjourning to closed session. Thank you, everyone.
Good afternoon, everyone tuning in. It is 5.35 p.m. My name is Vivian Malaulu, and I would like to call the regularly scheduled uh, Long Beach Community College District Board of Trustees May 27th meeting to order for the open session. We just um, had part one of our closed session. We will need to meet again. Uh, just to report out item 1.4 on the closed session agenda, the board did give the district direction. Item 1.5, we need to continue. Discussions were ongoing and we did not conclude that discussion. Items 1.6 and 1.7, we did not get to. So it might be a very long uh, second half of the closed session after the meeting. Now, uh, I would like to reconvene and begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. And I have already made arrangements with our student trustee, Jana. This is her last meeting. I had asked her to lead us in the pledge uh, for our first meeting, her first meeting. And now she'll be leading us in the flag salute for her final meeting as student trustee. So, Jana. Yes, if you can stand, um, go ahead and please rise. And for those who can't, that's okay. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America. America. Into the Republic, Republic, Republic for which it stands, stands one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenna. Okay, Madam Secretary, if you could please call roll. Daniel Baxter? Here. Vivian Malaulu? Here. Uduak Joe Intuk? Here. Doug Otto? Here. Sunny Zia? Here. And student trustee Jimenez? Here. Thank you. And uh, item 2.4, there is nothing to report other than item 1.4, the district did give um, direction. The board gave direction to the district. Now, Madam Secretary, do we have any public comments on agenda items? No, President Malulu, we do not. Thank you. Item 2.6, the approval of the minutes of the April 22nd, 2020 Board of Trustee meetings. So move. Second. We have a motion by Trustee Baxter, I believe, that it's hard to distinguish voices, is that correct? Yes. And the second, I, I think it was student trustee. Is that correct? Yes. All right. So we've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, excuse me, board president. Um, in order to record the vote, I have to have a trustee make the second because board docs will not record. I'll make the second. This is trustee Zia. Okay, Thank trustee you. Baxter made the motion. Trustee Zia seconded. Any discussion? Uh, we, do, we do have to take a roll call vote now, correct? Yep. <laughs> Virginia Baxter? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduak Joanne Tuck? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. And Sunny Zia? Aye. Student Trustee Jimenez? Aye. And I will record that you made the motion in the minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we're moving on to item 2.7, which is our ASB president report. We have our current for another couple of weeks, student body president, Alyssa here, and she will introduce our incoming student body president, Caesar. Welcome both of you. Hello, hello everyone. Um, so since it's my last meeting, I wrote out a little speech, uh, so bear with me. Uh, good evening, board president Malaulu, board members, staff and faculty, and most importantly, my fellow students. This past month has been a whirlwind, Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting, email after email. <laughs> I witnessed firsthand just how much the people at LBCC truly cared. Just today, my phone has been blowing up from my cabinet members telling me how happy they are that Student Life took the time to visit each of us to drop off award bundles to celebrate the end of our term. I saw many of you rally together to afford graduates like myself that same pride and joy we may be missing out on from a traditional commencement by doing something as crazy as having a cheer squad while we picked up graduation things. As this is my last trustee address as the ASB president, I wanted to take the time to express my deepest of gratitudes 
to the school that has truly given me so much. To my faculty mentors, especially Dr. Janae Hund, Professor Kristen Hartford, Dr. Matthew Lawrence, thank you for believing in me at times far more than I believed in myself. To my student life family, specifically my two advisors, Taylor Robertson and Kim Hammond, thanks for letting me cry in your offices when I got overwhelmed. Um, to my cabinet members, thank you for staying patient and staying driven and hungry the whole time we were together. Um, and I think before I end my address and I announce uh, my successor here, I really want to take the time to really highlight the concept of affording student body government stipends. Um, it's been an honor and has been an absolute joy to be the ASB president, but especially as things went on with the pandemic, everything, as you saw, I was in almost every single meetings as you are, you were I did it completely free voluntarily for the students. And though I knew personally what I was getting myself into, I do truly feel like this is something that needs to be advocated for. Um, that being said, um, I am more than proud and excited and everything good things to announce um, my successor, Cesar um, Fierro, as our new ASB president. And a report for me. Thank you very much, Alyssa. Caesar, would you like to say a few words? Yes, I just wanted to say thank you to our current ASB president for all her hard work that she has done this year. If it wasn't for her, she wouldn't have been able to help ASB grow in general. And I also wanted to say and let you guys know that I'm looking forward to working with each and one of you throughout my presidency and making sure that our students' or voices are being heard. I would really like to make a big difference before I leave. And knowing that I'm so passionate about Long Beach City College, I would really like to make students feel like they're at home at OBCC. See it as a second opportunity and a place to grow. I appreciate you, you so much, Alyssa. I would dearly miss you a lot. But as your pre predecessor, I'm hoping that I'm able to live off your legacy and hopefully we can make a big difference in the school. Thank you. Aww. Thank you very much. Um, Alyssa, we would like, you know, I, I don't know if any of the other board members would like to speak, but just on behalf of the board, we thank you, we commend you. This was not an easy semester to be presiding over. I speak from experience. You've done a great job. I appreciate the opportunities that you were still able to provide with your cabinet to our student body. And congratulations on UC Davis. Good for you. Caesar. we'll be seeing a lot of you in the coming year. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to item 2.8, which is our student trustee report. Jenna Jimenez. Hey, everyone. Um, thank you for having me as your student trustee this semester. I do want to announce that I will be student trustee next year. So that's going to be very exciting to continue with you all. I'm glad that I got the chance to get to know you and work with you. I understand the system, and so it's going to be a great year next year, and I look forward to advocating for the students. I'm going to be working closely with Caesar for advocating for the students, so him and I are both very passionate people. So we, we are very excited about next year, even though most of it's going to be online. We're still excited about being creative and seeing what we can do to you know, just make this a better experience for the students. A um, couple things I do want to report on as well um, is the lead commencement committee, which has been doing, thank you, first of all, Luann, um, for President Luann for um, inviting me into this committee because I got to see firsthand of how committed the faculty is to making this a special experience, the most special experience that it can be at this time. So I just really appreciate the effort that's been put out by faculty and the things that um, they put together, the media team especially, they've been putting in so much work. Um, I've been working with them as well, um, doing the, the virtual commencement uh, speeches and it's just amazing to see what, what Long Beach City Co College can pull together to make something great, um, even considering the situation. So. 
It's amazing. There's another thing I do want to report as well. Joshua Castellanos um, actually worked with the city to get the Cal Worthington board sign um, to announce our graduates. So that's an amazing thing that um, our graduates can see. And, um, you know, he, he reached out to me saying, what can we do to make this even more special? And we kind of brainstormed little ideas and he had that idea and I just, I loved it. I, I'm so excited that he got that um, into, into fruition. So that's definitely been a plus for all of the graduates. Um, and lastly, food distribution. I do want to report on how amazing the food has been. Um, there, it's just the quality of the items I got to, luckily I got to um, participate in the uh, last one. I just was walking up to make sure everything was fine with, you know, the park, like the, I was just doing my own like care in wanting to like help out. Um, and then I ended up volunteering and like handing out food. And it was just amazing to see like the structure, the organization, the sense of cleanliness that we have the sense of like working together, the teamwork, and then also just like the quality in the items. When I brought my box home or my bag home, uh, my cousin that goes to a Cal State uh, was saying that her Cal State did not provide her the quality of food that Long Beach City College provided us. And so she was just at awe at a city college that is really just providing their students with the most that you know, that, that they can do. And it's just amazing to see what we can do. So I'm really excited about next year with you all. And um, I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenna. And I'm sorry, I must have missed the announcement that you were going to be our student trustee next year. I, I, I that slipped through the cracks because I wasn't aware of that. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Happy to have you back. You've done a terrific job advocating for students every step of the way. You articulate students' needs and concerns very well. And we appreciate seeing the growth in your personal leadership development as a student trustee. So we're excited about uh, you remaining on the board next year. Now, had I known that this was not your last meeting, Alyssa, we could do a do-over with the flag salute and I would have had you do it, dear. So thank you very much. Congratulations to all of you. We are going to move on to item 2.9, which is the LBCCFA bargaining president report. And I do see Diana there. <laughs> yes. away. Okay. Hello, board president Mala Ulu, board of trustees, interim president superintendent Bynum, and others in our LBCC community. First off, I wanna say best wishes to Alyssa. I'm looking for her on my little Zoom thing. Alyssa, um, I wish you well, and you have been a tremendous role model for others, and I want you to know that. Um, Cesar, welcome to the group. And Jenna, I'm glad that you'll remain as a board member. Um, as we come to the end of an academic year, uh, to say it was challenging would be an understatement. But as has been mentioned time and again, the LBCC community and especially the faculty have moved mountains during this uncertain time. FA is comprised of our members, a 14 member e-board, um, executive board and a 26 member representative council. The council is comprised of one representative from each department in the college. From time to time, I brought some executive board members and representatives to address the board. And I've done so because I think it's important that everyone understands FA is not just me. It's not Diana Ogimachi, but it's the faces that you've seen step forward to speak to you. Tonight, we're fortunate to have two representatives who are going to share their experience of transitioning to a remote online modality. First, we'll have speak Dr. Robin Arias from the Life Science Department, who will address what it was like to take her microbiology class, which incidentally is a prerequisite for our nursing program online, as well as Alex Halstead, Halstead, excuse me, Shea, 
who will talk about what it's like to teach public speaking. So I'll let Dr. Arias begin. All right, thank you. Can every, uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Okay, um, good evening board president Mala Ulu, board of trustees, interim superintendent president Bynum and others. My name is Robin Arias and this is my 14th year teaching microbiology in the life science department. Last week, an NPR interview highlighted the demands that California community colleges will face as many new students are looking for reemployment opportunities during this recession. And here at LBCC, our microbiology course provides exactly that an opportunity for reemployment in nursing. There wasn't any intention of getting our microbiology course online uh, before COVID-19 because the class does not matriculate to the RN programs, including our own at LBCC. I do want to make note that when I notified my students about the possibility of going online, many were less than enthusiastic about the idea. Two hours ago, I just reached out to a student sobbing in tears because she was overwhelmed uh, by learning the volume of lab material online in an online format for our final tomorrow. So my starting point was a group of students somewhat resistant to the idea of learning online. On my last day on campus, I hustled in the lab to create videos of the students' lab results and future lab setups. I brought my tripod in and did video recordings of everything I could on such short notice in case we wouldn't be returning. I share all of this with you because I felt it was really important and worth the extra time and effort to create videos in our lab space with our equipment in order to make the, the experience more authentic. There was the overwhelming task of number one, creating the content, number two, making it available in 24 hours with technology I've never used before, while at the same time, keeping my students engaged, motivated, and reassured in times of a pandemic. I had to ease my students into this virtual space while many of my students were facing extra pressures of job loss, children out of school, and worry about exposures to COVID at their jobs. Another challenge of moving remotely is all of the hours invested in recreating quizzes and exams from scratch because faculty do not have the support of software to effectively proctor and maintain the integrity of our exams like other community colleges. But I know IT is on this. I have to squeeze that in. This is yet another demand placed on me that is normally much more manageable in a face-to-face -face environment. This semester, my students at least got to experience our lab facilities before moving remotely. In the fall, I would say there are more challenges. Now I have to instruct students who have never walked into a microbiology lab and convey not just the concepts, but techniques and lab setups virtually. What has been reassuring is the technical and emotional support provided by my dedicated colleagues. Having interacted with many of you uh, board members, I do feel confident um, that you will work with faculty on a fair and equitable contract. So thank you very much. Alex, where are you? You're muted, Alex. <laughs> okay, there you go. And I lecture every day on Confer Zoom. I should know this by now. Uh, to the board, hello. My name is Alex Atlastad Shea. I am a proud member of the Communication Studies Department. I have been at Long Beach City College for about seven years now, and I call this my home, and I love my students like you would not believe. I'd like to just briefly share with you what it was like uh, to transfer in that long weekend in March when we had to move all of our public speaking, our debate, and our oral interpretation classes to an online atmosphere. You could imagine these are classes that should be given face to face. These are the skills we want to instill in our students. So I can tell you that was a very long and complicated weekend. And over the semester, we uh, have successfully moved over almost 100 classes to where we are now teaching our students uh, synchronously through live, live sessions, through Confer Zoom as we're doing right now. 
Uh, and we also did it asynchronously through YouTube lectures and online debates so that we could accommodate our students that have to work and could no longer attend during the regular scheduled time. This semester has been one of the most enlightening experiences I've ever had as, a, as an instructor and as a human. We have been exploring new ways of teaching and new ways of engaging our students, and it has absolutely been uh, life-changing for me. It has also been extremely challenging, not only to figure out the best way to reach our students and encourage them and motivate them and, and teach them, but it's also been heartbreaking uh, hearing their stories and what, what they're going through. To highlight some positive, wonderful uh, things, I saw this opportunity to let students discuss and learn about COVID-19 and to, to share their, their feelings. And in such, uh, we've had some presentations about what the mask symbolizes in our culture. We've had debates about why some in our culture feel that they should not have to wear a mask, where others feel that you must be obligated to wear a mask. Uh, I had a wonderful speech given by one of my students who's an ER nurse at the front lines, and she gave a speech to our, our students about how to stay calm in moments of stress. So these are our wonderful students and what they're accomplishing. On the flip side, I cannot tell you how many emails I've gotten about students that uh, can barely get out of bed because they are so overwhelmed with life. Um, I have a veteran who is uncomfortable recording speeches because he's not comfortable with the technology, but he's also not comfortable putting himself out like that. I also had one of my best students uh, drop out of the class because he now has to pay the mortgage because his parents no longer can. So my point is we really appreciate your support. We all care for our students and we are trying our absolute best to give them the, the great education that they deserve and we will continue to strive uh, to do so. So thank you for your time. Thank you, the reps, the two reps. So as you've heard, these two reps, from the two reps, that faculty have been challenged by this COVID experience, as have all of us. I believe the situation has amplified the idea that faculty working conditions facilitate student learning conditions. Faculty at the end of the semester are tired, but for most, we will spend the rest of the summer training to perfect our skills um, on how to teach online, as well as perfecting our classes to be taught in an online venue, as we are now aware that fall semester will be offered once again, mostly online. So I ask for all of your support in closing negotiations so we as faculty can have the security to concentrate on what we do best, which is assisting our students fulfill their goals and dreams. So thank you very much. Thank you, Diana and Robin and Alex. Appreciate those remarks. Thank and you. The experience that you have shared. Item 2.10 is our um, AFT bargaining president report. And I see Robert there. Take it away, Robert. Uh, good evening, Board President Malalulu, uh, Interim President uh, Bynum, and esteemed board members. We want to start out by recognizing all the classified that are working harder than ever in supporting the student success from their remote locations and on campus. Also, we want to thank the LBCC nursing students for their volunteer work at the LBCC uh, COVID testing sites at both campuses. Thank you for all you're doing for the college. I would like to report that AFT started contract negotiations with the district and we hope to have it completed by the end of June. AFT believes at this time, LBCC, LBCC should be con financially conservative in this unstable time. With the president governor's educational budget and major cuts that have been posted, 
We hope that the board will be conservative on all proposed salary increases until the governor's budget is finalized. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you, Robert. And now we will go on to item 2.11 for the certificated hourly instructors bargaining president report. Is Karen on? Does anyone see Karen? I don't see her on here. Okay, seeing none, we will move on to item 2.12. This is reordering of the agenda. Are there any requests? Linda Malunda. Yes, Trustee Antuck. Since we didn't finish closed session, can we put item 5.4 at the after closed session, the second closed session? I'm sorry, 5.1, sorry, 5.1. Uh, which is the amended employment contract. We didn't get a chance to talk about that. So you would like to, re just, to just to make sure I understand you, you'd like us to go through the agenda, go through a second closed session, and after second closed session, come back and do item 5.1? Correct. Okay, got it. All right, can I get a motion on that? Do, Mary, do we need a motion or is that just a request? Yeah, here you're on mute. May I make a suggestion um, if it works for trustee intent or something? Maybe we could have break for a recess for you to go back into closed session, not now, but maybe after some of the other items are finished so that it's not quite at the end of the whole agenda and many public members will not be watching or for your report back and to that item? That's just a suggestion. It's not, I don't know if that would work for you or not. I'm, I'm flexible. I, I just know that it was on the closed session. Yes. Six and we didn't talk about it at all. So yes, you right. without having. it could happen before, but possibly you could go back into a closed session for just that item. Or, uh, or maybe as we're going through the agenda, we we'll just skip it and come back later in the meeting. I don't, I don't know, mm -hmm. whatever the board's preference. Yeah, you do need to have that closed session before you approve it, but it, then you're really waiting, making the public wait for so long um, for maybe that particular item. I don't know if it... <laughs> maybe that might motivate us to move faster. Yeah, <laughs> it could be, it could be. Yeah, All right. and everything so, is important on the agenda, but you know, it's. Okay, so do we need a motion on that or it just. Uh, no, it's procedural, we're going, if, if if there is no objection, we would like to know if there's any objection from the board. No objection. No objection. Okay. Um, Chair Malauulu, um, I'd like to also request, I think somehow that it was missed, uh, the public comment uh, on non-agenda items and perhaps we can have public the public be heard. Um, before we move on to um, item uh, three, three point one. Call for public comment on agenda items. I know. I'm, I'm asking we um, reorder the agenda and hear the public first, since it looks like we're going to have um, a long meeting. Okay. Uh, you did request um, if there was. You did ask if there was any comments for. Um, for agenda Close items, session. but I think Trustee Close Zia session. is referring to non-agenda items. We had uh, item 14.1. Okay, to speak, but we had requested to speak on item 5.4. Um, we we're trying to do it through the uh, chat. It's not. Yes, so I don't Ms. Just Ms. Medina, to... I have uh, texted Board President Malaulu. You will be yeah. able to speak when the item is discussed. Thank you very much. You don't have to do it, wait for the public comment. Um, Are there any more? Right, other? Okay, may I say um, the public was allowed to speak on agenda items under 2.5. We did not have any requests to do so. Do we have any public comments on non-agenda items that we can hear the public? We, we did not receive okay. any requests. That's, that's all I was referring okay. to, just yes. to give the public a little bit of a reprieve on waiting so long. Okay, so Trustee Otto, you had an objection and uh, Trustee Baxter did not. What about Trustee Zia? Do you have an objection to I, meeting item 5.1 until after second closed session? I, I did not uh, have an objection. No. Oh, you did not? Did not. Okay, I, I apologize. I, I, yes, yes, I didn't. 
<laughs> I, I have echoes. I, I've got echoes happening here. Okay. All right. Well, I don't have any objections either. Okay. Perfect. Seeing no objections, then we will go ahead and reorder the agenda to move item 5.1 until after the second closed session. And uh, just everyone keep in mind as we move through the agenda, maybe we'll be motivated to move efficiently but expeditiously you're doing well so we're moving on to section three on the agenda which is our superintendent president report Ms. bynum your turn please you're muted yes thank you president malaulu and trustees and um good evening everybody um i we I, there are a few items i want to share with you um one is a retirement that's coming to us tonight. Um, it's for Michael Burke. Um, he is a classified personnel member. He was deputy director operations and maintenance and he served for 12 years in really good standing here at the college. Um, before his uh, position as de deputy director of ops, he was facilities maintenance manager from 2008 to 2015 and then he served as deputy director from 2015 to 20. And prior to coming to Long Beach City College, he worked at UC Irvine from 1997 to uh, 2008 as a building systems technician and a maintenance um, mechanic. I know Mike personally, I know him to be a very committed Long Beach City College staff member who did his job diligently and always spoke about the students. And sometimes you don't always find that from someone who's got buildings and grounds and other kinds of operations. But um, I've heard him talk about student success in the past when I was here prior to that. I want to wish him the very best of luck in his new chapter and just let him know that he's going to be missed at Long Beach City College. Um, I also just want to salute the classified staff. Um, this has um, been very difficult for them too. This classified staff week was last week and I know that they've been doing a Herculean job. They are day-to-day -day heroes for all of us and they keep our entire operations going smoothly and oftentimes they're the front door for students who come so my congratulations to the classified staff for the amazing job that they they've done and continue to do and what they're doing here as well um, during the pandemic and our unusual circumstances um, you know about our virtual commencement ceremony. Jenna talked about that. It's going to be June 12th at 5 o'clock. We've had 360 students sign up as of Friday, and we're reaching out to another 2,200 20, students to try to make sure that they sign up as well. Um, I know that we've got a hardworking team doing some very creative things, and some of you have been taped, so thank you for participating in that. Um, we also had a cap and go event last Friday where we were able to hand out bundles that included caps and 2020 tassels, a travel bag, party favors, an LBCC Viking mask. We had 160 graduates that were able to do that. We had 16 wonderful volunteers, including our current ASB president, Elisa Teneza Jones, and our new ASB president, Cesar Fierro. And I also understand that uh, President uh, Malo Ulu and Trustee Jenny Baxter were there as well to greet the students. So thank you for that. It was a very, I've heard from a couple of students, they enjoyed it very much. Um, so you're aware I've been appointed by Los Angeles County Supervisor Janice Hahn to the LA County Economic Resiliency Task Force representing education. That task force consists of about 39 businesses and cultural leaders, and President Malaulu is also on that task force. The purpose is to provide guidance on the reopening and recovery of LA County economy, and I want to thank Supervisor Hahn for making sure that education is included in that task force. Um, there'll be a, a resolution later tonight, but we have an event in honor of Asian Pacific Islander Facey Heritage Month. Um, May 28th at 1 o'clock, we'll have a keynote speak from Congresswoman Judy Chu, who will be discussing the rise of hate crimes against the Asian Pacific Islander Facey community as this kind of country faces the pandemic. Uh, many of you may not know that Congresswoman Xu is the first Chinese-American woman to serve in the U.S. Congress and is chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American uh, Caucus. So we hope you can join us. That's actually tomorrow at 1 o'clock. 
Also some incredibly great news from financial aid. Through the hard work and collaboration across our campus, the financial aid office was able to award students financial aid three months earlier than we have done in the past and possibly the earliest time in the history of Long Beach City College. Um, for the upcoming year, 10,000 students were notified on May 20th of how much financial aid they're eligible to receive, which makes a big difference for them. They have much more certain, certainty going into the fall semester. Um, we expect that we'll be able to get more enrollments from students who um, can be assured of their financial aid. And I know I was here for 20 years prior to this, and I don't think in any of those 20 years we were able to get out financial aid as early as we had. So congratulations, Dr. Munoz, your staff, um, faculty staff, and everybody who have worked on this. It's really a great um, uh, watermark for us. On May 19th, I presented an LBCC update to 50 attendees of the Foundation's Board of Governors. And we have two new Board of Governors coming from um, Lakewood. Valerie Frost, who is the Director of Recreation and Community Services for the City of Lakewood. And Mario Vargas, Senior Executive Director at Lakewood Family YMCA. I want to, again, thank the Foundation for their ongoing support here to the college. We've got a donation of 100 Chromebooks, and we'll be scheduling a time to hand those out. And the matching funds that they put together have gone past the $70,000 mark now. So the Foundation, the Board of Governors have done a wonderful job. Also, just to give you an update, um, you may know, most of us know that we have a rapid testing site at PCC as well as a testing site at LAC. And um, we've been getting some really good data on the ability of the city to be able to use our services. The drive-through testing at Bay Veteran Stadium has accommodated 1,914 people since May 22nd, and that's still going strong. Our Pacific Coast campus is still the site of rapid assessment testing, and we've tested approximately 711 people there. Um, as a reminder, the city of Long Beach is responsible for the facilities, the security, and that. But uh, one really great piece of news added to that is our LBCC nursing students have been able to be at both sites getting clinical hours with some of our faculty helping out in these testing sites. So that's turned out to be a win-win for us. Another piece of good news, our digital medical imaging students had to have part of their lab suspended in the spring and they've been able to go in and complete the lab work, 18 of our students for the class of 2020. A um, couple of weeks ago, they had simulation labs with faculty there and they are able now to take their test on the national board exam. So we're thrilled about that. Um, also, I want to, I want to congratulate Congratulate Elisa. I don't know if she's still here. I don't see her name, but she's done. She's been a firecracker, I think, representing the students uh, as associated student body leader. And she's um, modeled some really excellent leadership, I think, for the following people that will be coming in. Um, ASB president, congratulations to Cesar Fierro. LAC vice president, Norman Barsugli. Student trustee, Jenna Jimenez, she's doing number two year as our trustee. Interclub Council President, David Romero. And Interclub Council LAC Vice President, Shoop Shoop. And Interclub Council PC Vice President, Patty Guerrero. And there, sh this should be on a slide, I don't know if it's up yet, but Professor Walter Hamilwood in the Journalism Department um, informed us that LBCC won 15 awards from the Journalism Association of Community Colleges. Our journalism program is renowned for its excellence in producing future journalists. One of them is sitting on this Zoom dais right here as our president. Congratulations, though, to the 15 awards won by our journalism student. Every year that I've been here, our journalism program seems to get awards, and I'm just really happy to see that that's continuing. And speaking of awards, also congratulations to the public affairs and marketing team for winning various advertising awards. Three gold and two silver from the 2019 Collegiate Advertising Award. Three gold, one silver, and four awards of merit at the 35th Annual Educational Advising Advertising Awards. And congratulations to the entire team. They do a remarkable job, and I know all of you work really hard and help them 
uh, work to be able to put out this wonderful stuff. And then, if you can bear with me finally, I do want to read um, a letter to you that came in from one of our students. Um, let me just read it and I'll give a little more background. Um, she sent this letter to, her, to our Associate Dean, Kenna Hillman. My name is Denisha Harris and I'm a current and continuing student at LBCC's Liberal Arts Campus. I would like to commend all of LBCC staff members who have ensured that students are capable of receiving all of the tools, relief, and access to programs that are essential in helping us to pursue our academic endeavors. I am one of the many students who received the additional 500 financial assistance, which in turn helped me to be able to pay my rent. I have been in awe at the level of dedication shown towards students who are fearful, hungry, and doing their best to fight off despair. Growing up, I was always taught how attending college will open doors. And outside of prospective employment opportunities, I did not see the many ways this particular statement could become possible. That said, LBCC has proven to be an idiom that comes true. The open line of communication between school and students has shown us where to pick up food, access free to affordable Wi-Fi, find assistance with housing, and where to seek counseling for emotional support. Your establishment has made every effort to see to it that we not only survive, but thrive. I want to personally thank all of you and do my part in making sure that you are aware of just how appreciated your attention to the actualization of our success has been. No one could have anticipated such a shift in time, and I have been inspired by your institution's acts of grace. I look forward to the day where I can pay it forward by financially sewing into my alma mater's reserves. In the meantime, I will continue to honor your fruitful labor by maintaining straight A's and an unshakable commitment to excellence. I did not know exactly whom to mail. I just searched through the directory and using my best efforts in the game of eeny, meeny, miny, mo, best, Denisha Harris. And that's the end of my report. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that you called out all those students by name. I know that they appreciate the recognition as well as the awards that our various departments have won. And uh, I love the uh, extra plug that journalism always wins year after year. I'll make sure we reiterate that. I can, I can never hear that in true. <laughs> Keep it coming. So congratulations. Yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, we would like to move on to our presentation for this evening. And we only have one. So uh, this is uh, section 4.1 on the agenda accreditation update report. And this is Dr. Heather Van Volkenberg, who will uh, lead us through that presentation. Yeah, President Malaulu, if I may, um, just this is a quick update to just give the status of where we are with the board, as well as um, give you all a heads up that the board evaluation will be coming probably in July of this year. And uh, more information about that in the process will be forthcoming. So I'll turn it over to Heather. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, President Malauulu, um, Interim Superintendent Bynum, Board of Trustees, Vice Presidents, colleagues, and of course, our wonderful and fabulous students. Um, as uh, President Bynum noted, this is just a quick update on our accreditation efforts. Um, and so basically, we will talk a little bit about the trainings and timeline that have occurred already. January 31st, we had a Zoom training with our liaison at ACCJC, who is actually the president, Stephanie Droker. Um, she gave a quick overview of the standards to constituency leaders and accreditation committee. Um, April 30th, we did another Zoom training that went into a more in-depth review of how to interpret the standards and how to provide relevant evidence for the ICER, for the Institutional Self-Evaluation Report that we'll be drafting. So, you know, we, we heard before I started all of the work done by our faculty, all of the hard work done by our classified, all of the struggles our students are working through and how the college is supporting them. And in light of all of that, we still had 74 people, constituency leaders, accreditation committee members, which include faculty, classified staff, and administrators, attend this training. So I just think it's really important to call out how much work everyone is doing, and yet we still maintain this focus on this critical work that we are doing for the college and accreditation. Just to give you a heads up, um, so the next year, the, the college and these committees will be drafting the ICER. 
And then we'll be bringing that to the review for the Board of Trustees in November, and then a second reading will be in December of 2021. Um, the report itself is due to ACCJC in January of 2022. And then the site team will be on site. They'll come visit in March 2022, just to give you a sense of that timeline. June 2022 is when they'll make the decision. The commission will make a decision. So next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so what have we done so far? We've established the committees that I referenced before that went through, you know, the tri chairs and members of those committees went through the meetings in January and April. Um, and so we have a steering committee that kind of manages the committees, and then we have nine standard area committees, because as you know from previous presentations, there's a lot of um, areas that the standards are grouped within. Um, we also conducted some gap analyses. I think this was actually a Trustee Intook suggestion in a previous presentation, and so we took that to heart, and we conducted a couple gap analyses on where we stand with um, compliance in the standards. We did one in January, and we followed up and did another one in May. And again, these are approximate compliance um, levels, right, because we're basically taking something that is, you know, a qualitative you know, measure and making it some kind of quantitative number to give it something that is... Um, less abstract, I think. And so basically, as we went through kind of thinking about our best understanding of what the policies and standards from the commission are saying and what we're doing locally in terms of practice and policy, we can see across the board from January to May, there were increases. Um, and again, this is broken out by the four main standards. So standard one, you know, increased from 69 to 81%, standard two, 70 to 83%, standard three, 82 to 88%, and then finally leadership and governance from 67 to 77%. So it's, it's, it's great to see that, you know, the college is really working um, to really make improvements in these areas. Next slide, please. Some critical things for um, the Board of Trustees to know, particularly in respect to the to standard area four. So one of the standards, and we've talked a little bit about this before, is that there's an annual evaluation of the Board of Trustees. It's required for ACCJC standard for C10. It's also in our local policy and administrative regulations 2018. And so last year's is missing, and we also need to complete this year's. Additionally, the standards require that these results be um, posted publicly. Um, it's also important for the Board of Trustees to be knowledgeable about accreditation and participate in this evaluation of governing board roles. Um, this is per standard area 4C13 um, and our local policy 1003. Um, and so we have a link here for more information regarding the standards. Um, my, my son here is having a little bit of problems. So I'm going to put myself on mute, but I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Dr. Van Volkenberg, I was going to suggest uh, if you wanted us to come back so you could complete the, uh, I don't know if you wanted to just go a little bit further. That is the last slide, I'm sorry. Or if you wanted to yield the floor to your son and have him contribute, we love entertain <laughs> his presentation. We love having the little ones around. Thank you. No, this was my last slide, so I'm opening it up to questions now, thank you. Thank you. I actually had to close my um, camera because we have two new puppies. Most of you already know this. I had to go close windows and doors. So I'm home alone. My family's gone, but now the dogs are making noise and I'm not used to that. So I can relate, but you did a really good job. I don't have any questions. I was actually following along. I printed the presentation and I was following along with you. I think it's a really good update. Does anybody else have any questions? either from uh, Dr. Van Volkenberg or this, the junior Van Vol Volkenberg. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Really appreciate that. We will move on to section five on the agenda, which is the Board of Trustees. And we have already tabled item 5.1 for after the second closed session. And we are going to item 5.2, which is a resolution of classified school employee week. And this is an action item. I will defer to Vice President Jean Duran. If, if is that correct, or would you be the one to introduce this, or who would like to have the pleasure of introducing this item? Sure, I can introduce it if you like. Um, as you know, every every year in the third week of May is uh, Classified Employee Week. Uh, so this resolution provides 
uh, the board an opportunity to recognize that. Um, and there were events and videos that happened last week. Unfortunately, it wasn't the fun that we have with uh, lunches and uh, class yeah. professional development day and other things, uh, but we do our best under the current circumstances that we're in. Thank you very much. Um, reading out the recommended action that the Board of Trustees adopt resolution number 052720A, declaring the week of May 17th through the 23rd, 2020 as classified school employee week and is recognized by the state of California through a bill signed by the governor in 1986 as submitted. The third week of May has been designated as classified school employee week and is recognized by the state of California through a bill signed by the governor in 1986. Not sure why that statement repeats itself, but it's there. So we need a second, we need a motion and a second, please. So no move. <clears throat> Okay, I heard uh, Trustee Otto and Trustee Baxter. All right, uh, Madam Secretary, is there any discussion on this? I, I would just like to uh, congratulate our classified staff once again. We can't sing your praises enough for all the work that you've all done uh, maintaining the campus. And I know that your workload will actually increase when it's time to return because of the additional cleaning protocols that have to be followed. Uh, disinfecting and social distancing and labeling and uh, making sure that we have the appropriate barriers in place. So I thank you in advance for that. And I too miss the annual barbecue, not so much for the barbecue itself, but for the opportunity to hang out and the rapport. And um, many thanks to the personnel commission who always um, does a really good job with that. And uh, I was on campus a couple of weeks ago and we did a, uh, a short video uh, just commending the classified staff and Josh Castellanos. Um, I don't remember what he said, what the prompt was, but he said something like, you know, close with something like a thank you. And I just blurted out a thank you in English, Spanish and Samoan. So I think I surprised myself with that, but that's how grateful I am. I'm grateful in three different languages. So thank you very much. Any any additional discussion on that item? Steve Baxter? Yeah, I just wanted to salute the classified uh, personnel. Um, they do so many jobs that are not visible, and yet they're essential. And so um, I'm so glad that we have this week, so it takes us time to think about how important the classified uh, employees are at our institution. So thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Secretary. If you can please uh, do a roll call vote. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduwak Joe Intuck. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. And forgive me, but I should be asking Trustee Jimenez first. <laughs> That's okay. I know it's not on the screen for you, so it's hard to remember that one, but. Yes, it is. That's true. Aye. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, motion carries. Now we'll move on. Congratulations to our classified staff, Robert, and to everyone tuning in. Thank you very much for your service. And CC, our own classified Senate representative, we really appreciate you. Keep up the great work. Moving on to item 5.3. This has been an ongoing item um, because of different um, just parameters and restrictions that were set in place regarding the change in the elections and regarding all the changes that we have to adhere to with uh, getting sworn in. So this is um, item 5.3, scheduling of the third Monday, December 21st, 2020 board meeting. This is a regular and annual organization. Uh, it, it just, uh, there will be an earlier meeting in December, which I believe will be the regular December board meeting. And this one will be to swear in the new officers and to reorganize the board with board election. Uh, excuse me, board president Malaulu. Um, yes. We were unaware that you wanted another, an earlier regular meeting and that would have to be before the election. Um, this you know what, that's right, Jackie. Yes. I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but you're right. I just remembered that we had that conversation already. You're yeah. right. So we still have to decide when the oath. That's it. But you're absolutely right. Um, I remember that. And also, it had to be on a Monday because there were schedule conflicts with holidays and religious holidays. And 
the district, the college being closed. So uh, Jackie, thank you, because I know you put in a lot of work trying to get that date and make sure that it was agreeable to the majority of the board. This is an action item, so I will entertain a motion and a second that the Board of Trustees amend the 2020 board meeting calendar to set the date of December 21st, 2020 as its regular and annual organizational meeting as submitted. So moved. Second. We've got a motion by Trustee Zia, second by Trustee Baxter. Any discussion on that item? I, I do. Trustee Antuck? Yeah, I, you know, I'm still concerned that we're having the meeting during a week that the campus is closed um, versus the prior week uh, when the campus is open. I know we did uh, have some discussion about uh, potential conflict with Hanukkah, um, but unlike other Jewish holidays, Hanukkah has no work restrictions during uh, those days. So, you know, it was brought up as somehow disrespectful or inc in incongruent with the holiday. Um, but, but that is not actually the case. Uh, and I, you know, I, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's a pleasure to the board, but, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's, I don't know what maybe president Biden can share. Are we going to have to have staff overtime for that day when the campus is closed? Um, actually the campus is closed. The campus is open through December 23rd. Okay, so the schedules, holidays schedule were, changed. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's just no faculty, but yeah. I mean, technically the campus is open. It's a working day for everyone on the campus. And I wasn't aware of that until just recently. And then what's the last day of Hanukkah this year? Uh, eight, is it 18th? 18th. Yeah, 18th. Yeah. Okay. Any additional discussion on this item? Okay, Madam Secretary, if you can please do a roll call vote. Student Trustee Jimenez? Aye. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduwak Joe Intuck? Aye. Doug Otto? Uno Abstain? <clears throat> and Sunny Zia? Aye. Motion carries, thank you very much. Item 5.4, board determination of the manner in which contract number 99779.8, agreement with Leal Trejo, APC for legal services was initiated. This is a possible discussion action item. And we do have attorneys Francisco Leal on Zoom uh, available and also his partner, his colleague, Maribel Medina. So I would open up this item for discussion uh, from the board, please. Hey, um, President Malu, I, I can go first. Sure, Tristan. Antic. Yeah, no, um, this came about um, from last month's meeting going through the uh, purchase orders. Um, the majority of the board was unaware of this contract and we had asked several questions and got some follow-up uh, and trying to get some clarity. And I know um, representatives from the law firm are, are here and available, but I know some of the outstanding questions we had was um, how did the contract come about? Because it doesn't go through, or doesn't appear to be similar to our other contracts uh, that were signed by um, Vice President Drinkwine. Uh, it also doesn't form, the format doesn't comport with our typical contracting format or say the legal contracts we have on the agenda tonight. Um, and then we're unclear what services were gonna be provided and what direction was given. So maybe we can um, have representatives from the, from the law firm give some some background and some updates. I would like to. And uh, sure, uh, Francisco. Yes, thank you, um, board members, the president. Uh, you have you have two devices in the room, so one of them has to okay. go on mute. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, and uh, 
Let me, let me do this. <laughs> Apologize. <laughs> This is like sitting too close to somebody. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here before you. Uh, I've, uh, uh, we are here to answer any and all questions that you have regarding this. Uh, I looked at the agenda item and I uh, appreciated that your question was how it was initiated. And I gave that some thought. And I thought, you know, this contract was initiated when this district had the foresight to issue an RFP for legal services to diversify its legal bench. That was some time ago. We submitted, we were vetted amongst other firms, and ultimately we were placed on your bench. Um, nothing came out of it as far as work, and we understand that part, it's a process. And subsequent to that, we were invited to make a presentation when you were soliciting special counsel. Uh, Mari and I came to you and made a presentation. Um, we thought we did well, we like to believe we came in a very close second. Um, and I bring that up because it was out of that that uh, I approached one of your board members, member Zia, Trustee Zia, because we happen to live in the same condo complex. Uh, and my re recollection of that is I wanted an opportunity for your former superintendent uh, to meet with Maribel Medina, uh, uh, an introductory meeting to showcase our expertise. We did have a luncheon meeting. I believe it was in December. I'm not entirely sure of the dates. Um, I thought it was a good meeting. Uh, Mari can tell you more about it because the discussions really were between the two of them. Uh, the gist of it was in those discussions, uh, a contract was negotiated between your staff and Ms. Medina. Um, and ultimately, uh, it was approved. I'll confess to you, I did not know we had an approved contract until yesterday. So I should thank you now, and not then, uh, for that opportunity. Uh, I also learned that there may be some questions about its uh, uh, origins or, or what transpired. We are here to be very open with you with any and all questions you may have regarding the formation of this contract, the issues that were discussed, the type of work that was contemplated. And I think Mari's in the best position to address those issues because, because ultimately she was the one who was interfacing with uh, your former superintendent and your staff. And I can address this, um, let me just. It was if I could address um, board member uh, Udiak, uh, Udiak's um, direct question about the contract, we were um, put in, in, in contact with your contracting division. Um, there are instances where public entities attach a contract and they say this is the contract that will be used and you agree to it. That was not the case with your request for qualifications. Um, the college did not include a contract. We asked the college if there was a contract, the boilerplate that you would like to use. My understanding and the information that we were provided is that there are different contracts that are used for the different law firms. Um, they nonetheless had very strict requirements on indemnity and insurance. And we um, went back and forth with your purchasing and your contract um, personnel to have a contract that was acceptable to the college. We, um, to this date, you may know this, I'm not, uh, you referenced a purchase order. That's, again, that's the first that we've heard of it. Um, we were not aware that there was a purchase order to date. We have not provided the college any legal services um, so there are no invoices, there's no legal fees that have been submitted. Um, as we indicated, we have been very excited about the prospect of serving as one of your uh, legal bench, and especially because we are right in your backyard. We are a minority-owned um, Long Beach uh, law firm. Uh, so we have been tracking your agendas. We are very well aware of the um, the standard practice and the way that the the legal services agreements are presented to your board, you have two two methods. One is any contract above two hundred thousand dollars generally gets placed um, as its own item, and then you have your consent calendar and ratification of contracts that are below two hundred. Um, there are instances where the same law firm is identified multiple times in your two hundred. <laughs> Uh, limit uh, like it like is the case tonight in your in your agenda, but the process that was that we followed 
has been the process that we've tracked for the last year in, in the award of, of contracts to other firms. Thanks. I took some notes uh, regarding what you were asking. Uh, the, the conversations regarding the type of work were very general conversations showcasing our expertise in the area of personnel matters. There wasn't a specific item or specific issues. It was really essentially an opportunity for Ms. Reagan and to me, Ms. Medina, who's my law partner, to have a relationship that may, in essence, lead to an opportunity. And in fact, that is what happened uh, unbeknownst to us. So that's, that's, that, that's, as, that's as much as I can convey to you. If you have any specific questions, again, uh, we'll be more than happy to answer any, any of them. That's what we're here for you. Thank you, Maribel and Francisco. I, I believe, Trustee Untuck, you were attempting to speak. Oh, yeah, I have some more questions. You might be on mute. Uh, um, can you hear me okay? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Okay. And, and some of uh, the questioning that we had and information provided by our um, superintendent president was uh, we questioned what trustee okay. had a role. And we heard conflicting information that trustee Zia was involved and she said she wasn't involved. Can you talk about trustee Zia's involvement with uh, the contract, the meeting, or this lunch? or any subsequent activities that happened? I think that was asked and answered. Um, Trustee Intuk, um, uh, Francisco did speak to that when he uh, talked, but I, I'm happy to uh, okay. tell you that, you know, it is uh, accurate. Uh, Francisco lives in my building. He uh, asked for a meet and greet. Um, after the board council interview that they didn't get. And um, uh, as much as I liked their performance, I uh, voted for um, Mr. Ewing. Um, and I said, sure, I'm happy to make an introduction. Um, and when I, I unfortunately couldn't stay for the session for the entirety of it, and they had a um, conversation with Superintendent President R Romali, I don't know what happened afterwards as far as a contract is. Uh, uh, I think your question was uh, who was involved in the contract piece. I was not. I was, it was this was simply a meet and greet. And that's the extent of it. Um, and I think uh, Trustee, um, I think uh, uh, Francisco and Maribel uh, provided the details on the fact that they went through the process and won it fair and square through the RFQ process. And um, subsequently, um, it w the details were provided. But... Um, that's pretty much the gist of it. Um. Madam President, we apologize. We had a technological point, 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 yeah. point of order. I, I was hoping that um, Francisco and Maribel could answer the question and not trust easier. And I, I, I understand you had technical difficulty. Could you? So uh, I don't know if you want to go ahead. Yeah, Madam you President, do you mind um, repeating the question? We unfortunately were unable to hear. Uh, yeah, Trustee Anta, could you repeat the question that you asked of um, Francisco and Maribel, please? Yeah, can, can you guys hear me now? Yes. We can hear you. Great. Um, I was saying in, in kind of reference, we had asked our superintendent president to uh, look into the matter and tell us who was involved and what exactly were the uh, parameters of what was discussed and what trustees were involved and she reported back to trustee Zia was involved and then there was a second email saying that no she was not involved um, and wanted to get from your uh, experience the um, uh, involvement of trustee Zia and and what um, from your perspective what transpired sure uh, so from uh, from my perspective uh, after we made your presentation uh, at that special meeting uh, as I recall, because uh, Member Zia lives in my unit, uh, I spoke to her and uh, I was the one who approached her about the opportunity to have a meeting with a superintendent. And my goal at that point uh, was to promote my law partner uh, so that she could have an opportunity to interface directly with a superintendent 
and maybe through that create an opportunity uh, because opportunities were not forthcoming, quite honestly. We're, we had gone through a process and I thought that would be a good idea. We, um, on, at the May uh, 22nd board meeting, um, the board was presented with, uh, with, with uh, was called an update on the legal uh, selection of law firms. They identified each one of the law firms and what areas they were approved for by the, by the college's independent panel. Our law firm was fortunate enough to have been selected for all the different areas that we bid for, which was labor and employment, general counsel, litigation, and facilities. Um, when I had the opportunity to speak to um, your prior uh, superintendent, we did share with her our expertise, that we are um, almost exclusively a public entity law firm and that we conduct investigations for uh, a number of local public entities, that I in particular have done investigations for the city of Long Beach, um, for the um, uh, WRD, uh, and that not um, having your general counsel conduct the investigations is normally a better approach or not having your litigation counsel. When we handle litigation, we're normally not the investigators. So we did highlight for her that we have expertise in labor and employment and highlighted for her some of the litigation expertise as well. As far as negotiating the contract, we worked with the um, uh, business and support services and contract management. Um, we did not have any conversations at all with either um, uh, any of your board members or even your previous superintendent once the contract negotiation process began. We worked exclusively with your procurement um, uh, team. Uh, we did not, we were not consulted on how it would be presented on your agenda. As, as I've indicated, I've, I've reviewed the agendas for the last year, and it appears to me that they followed that standard process of identifying any contract up to 200,000 in your um, in your ratification section. Um, and so that's the process that they, they followed. Um, but to date, we have not been given any legal work, and so we have not had the opportunity to serve as legal counsel for the college. Okay. Um, Can you... Um, Sure. You know, you mentioned the investigations um, experiences at the city of Long Beach and water replenishment district. Did uh, uh, Trustee Zia or Reagan Romali talk to you about investigations on campus as a potential service? They, um, we identified that as, as an expertise. We did not discuss any particular matter. Um, we were hopeful that once we were on the bench, if the need arose, we would be one of the investigators that was ready um, for the college, but we did not get to the point of actually discussing any particular matter. And then I, you had mentioned that you track the agendas. Um, did you track the December 2019 uh, board agenda? What, what item in particular are you, um, would you be referring to? At that meeting, we uh, hired an investigator law firm to conduct an investigation. Okay. Did you see that on the agenda that month that you had the lunch meeting? I may have, um, I don't know, I may have uh, seen it. What we were looking at is the law firms that were being retained. Um, we did it primarily just to understand the, the issues that the district is, is undergoing, but is there a particular question related to that? Yeah, did um, Trustee Zia or Reagan Romali disclose that they were being investigated by the investigator hired in December by the board? Let me respond to that. No, not, not, I, I want to put it in the context. It was, it was a one-hour lunch that actually member Zia wasn't even there for the entire lunch. She had something to do with her, with City Hall. And, and, and it was, there was no discussion other than they get to know each other. There, there, there was no discussion about investigations on anything or anyone. Uh, it was pure and simple, uh, uh, an introduction about just general expertise, and we were looking for an opportunity. Uh, so uh, I'm not entirely sure what that uh, agenda item entails, but if it's something related to an investigation about specific folks, it, we know nothing about it. We did not get into any specifics on any particular investigation. We highlighted the expertise that we have. And I guess my last question on the contract amount of 200,000, 
you know, you were there that night last fall, I believe it was a September board meeting where we in interviewed and you participated and there was a lot of discussion about um, the $20,000 contract uh, being too much. Uh, yet this contract was 10 times the amount. Do you know how the $200,000 amount was set? Uh, we we have no idea about that amount and, and no amounts were even discussed uh in, in connection with our conversation none whatsoever if you pull up um and again your your staff may 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 have that information readily available to you the contracts that you have been approving at least in the last couple of months as we ha highlighted tonight you have a contract for atkinson lawyer for about four hundred thousand you had another amendment for Burke Williams of 500,000. So the amounts that the, the board has been allocating for your law firms are significant. But were we asked or were we told of the amount that was gonna be um, requested? Um, and the answer is no. Again, I wanna emphasize that uh, after that meeting, uh, and I lost track of it, quite honestly, uh, we were hoping that someone would call to let us know that there was an opportunity for us and that the contract was going to be on the agenda. Uh, I was somewhat pleasantly, I mean, in retrospect, but pleasantly surprised to learn that actually our matter uh, went on the agenda. And I will tell you, uh, this is uh, our law firm. If I would have known that we were on the agenda, I would have been there. I would have been there if you had any questions. Uh, that's how we, uh, that's how I do it. We didn't know. Uh, we learned about this situation over the last 48 hours. And so issues related to specific uh, questions about investigations are non-existent. Issues related to the amount of the contract were never, ever discussed. Uh, and the contract form is something that uh, Mari and uh, your staff uh, did the back and forth on that uh, culminated into a contract that I think in retrospect uh, is probably a decent contract because it's got all the indemnities. There's nothing in that contract that I would feel uh, would take advantage of any public entity. It's from our, from our understanding, the reason we didn't question it is it's very standard practice to allocate a set dollar amount, um, a not to exceed amount, and assign different legal matters to that, um, to that law firm. It's a little bit different when you're hired for one specific matter. So if, for example, I were retained to, to investigate a situation involving, I don't know, Mr. Smith, and they could say, oh, we'd like to retain you to do this, and here's a budget of 15000 or 10000 whatever the case may be, that's, that's normally how you allocate the smaller dollar amounts. So my understanding, um, and that was a conversation that this board engaged um, at great length on that um, when we had the... Uh, the presentation regarding special counsel was that you wanted to retain special counsel on a very isolated issue, um, negotiating one particular issue with one particular employee. Uh, so having the $20,000, $25,000 budget was appropriate here. We did not discuss any particular assignment other than our expertise and qualifications um, to serve as legal counsel um, when we had already been selected to be part of your legal bench. Uh, President Malulu, I, I have questions for staff, but if other trustees have uh, uh, questions on, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to yield the floor. I have a, a few questions myself. Um, first of all, um, thank you, Francisco and Maribel for making yourselves available. Thank you for being here tonight to answer these questions. Uh, I feel that it's necessary for me to also thank Trustee Untuck because he is the one who um, actually found this and brought it to my attention. Um, after last month's meeting, he called and asked me questions and I didn't know about it. Unfortunately, it was something that got past me. And the reason why it got past me, and this is one of the questions I have, is because this contract was under HR. And I thought that uh, because it was, you know, designated as an HR contract, I assumed that it had to do with something under Vice President Duran's um, jurisdiction of anything involving employees. So I, you know, didn't pay enough attention to it. So Trustee Antuck, thank you for bringing it to my attention. So. With that, I do have a couple of questions. Um, Maribel, when was when did you sign the contract? Uh, it was in 
the end of January 2020. Mm -hmm. So maybe January 29th. Okay, I, I was under the impression that this contract was signed in December, late December. Uh, that that's not accurate. I can give you the exact date, but uh, okay. And and just while while you're looking, or maybe Jean would have the exact date, but while you're looking for that, I just for my own uh, information, are are you and Francisco both partners at the firm? We are. Okay, so. It just doesn't make sense to me that you would enter a contract, whether it was in January or December, that your partner didn't know about until the last 48 hours. It's it's not unusual for us. We have um, it's uh, we are we are a small law firm and we divide up tasks here. Um, as I indicated in, in a memo I had provided before, I I'm generally in charge of um, overseeing the work of the attorneys and chairing the education and the litigation practice group. Francisco handles the advisory group. Um, we each trust each other. And if there is a client that falls more in the realm of the area of work that he performs, he signs the contract. I sign contracts for issues related to litigation. I'm the, I'm the partner that signed the contract with the city of Long Beach. Um, it is, we are, we are equal partners in terms of that, um, that task. I recall in our firm dealings that Mari did come to me and convey to me that there were uh, interactions because issues of rates. Uh, I, I guess there were discussions about the rate structure and I just recall saying do what you think is best and that's that's my recollection of uh, of this contract and and we do function rather separately uh, uh, if it's something that I would be in charge of, I probably would have been more on it. I probably would have been looking and checking into it. That explains to me why I never even knew that this contract uh, and was on your agenda. I, I never knew that it was approved. I uh, had no idea that we had received a, a, a contract and, and the amount too is, is all foreign to me. Okay, I, I understand that. Um, I, I understand what you're saying. Let me, let me clarify, I understand what you're saying. I don't understand, and I'm not going to get into the operations of your firm because, you know, I understand that everybody does things differently and you have the autonomy to operate independently and differently than other firms. But you saying that you're a small firm, in my opinion, $200,000 is not chump change. And that signing a contract with Long Beach City College, if you are in our own backyard, I would think that that would be cause for celebration or at least an announcement or an email letting Francisco know about it, especially since he's the one that initiated the meeting in the first place. But again, you know, everybody, I, I respect that you, you might not have that line of communication. So I, I do understand that. Um, I, which staff member were you working with at the time when you were working through this contract um, at the district? Was it one staff member? Was it two? Because if it fell under HR, but it was a meeting that was initiated. So if I, if I follow correctly, Francisco spoke to Trustee Zia, who is his neighbor, requested a meeting. Trustee Zia facilitated a meeting with the superintendent president. And a month later, you have a $200,000 contract under HR. I mean, I, Madam, Madam, Madam President, you know, if, if I may, that's that that is um, that is an accounting that's very inaccurate. And I had said this before. One of the things that's really important to us is our professional reputation. We understood, and I was I, I applauded the college for caring about the diversity of their legal bench, and especially because there have been years where not a single law firm that was minority owned had been given the opportunity to do work for the college. You reached out to minority bar associations like the Mexican American Bar Association to encourage minority owned law firms to apply. And we did. And for us, unlike the large law firm, submitting a, a response to a request for qualifications is a significant investment of time. It mattered to us, it was worth it because we care about educational entities and we want to do work more for we want to do work for the for the public entities that are here. So we we responded to that request for qualifications. We were vetted, like every other law firm, by an independent panel based on our education and our professional experience, and we were selected to serve on your panel. 
We then were told that the board approved the panel. We, we understand that it's been a very complex and complicated process. When we were interviewing before this board, it was obvious that it wasn't clear what the interview was even about for some individuals there. So we will concede that this entire process has been a, a, a hit and miss as we go. But the process was not that we had this lunch and suddenly we had a $200,000 contract. We followed, we responded to the request for qualifications. We were approved to serve on every single legal area that was um, selected. And it's a, it's a cost for celebration if we're going to receive work. It was a very um, unclear process for us. And if I can emphasize, we had no idea, and I maintain this emphatically, that this was a $200,000 celebration or contract. Uh, we, we, we had no idea of any allocation. As I stated to you, we, I and Mari didn't even know that a contract was approved, I guess, in February. And why would we, we just didn't see it. it uh, uh, no one called us, no one said it's on the agenda, uh, get some work, it's, we're, we're in May now, uh, and we're just moving along. Um, and my first re-entry into your world um, was that our contract, which was approved back in February, is now an issue of concern about how it was initiated. And that's what triggered my concern to convey to you all these facts. Uh, well, I, I'll speak a little bit to that. And, and Maribel, thank you for illustrating um, the effort that you make to try to be transparent and to, to be on the up and up. I appreciate that. And that's the reason why we're having this discussion publicly. Uh, for myself, the optics are bad. I'm president of the board. We have an investigation pending with our superintendent president and, you know, it, it goes on from there. And there are these clandestine meetings that are happening with another board member, unbeknownst to me or the rest of the board. There was no reporting. There was no information that was shared. And it's, it's questionable. And it's suspect to, you know, have a contract being signed. Um, the reason why, and I'm going to tell you from my, my personal experience, is staff put us through the ringer for a $20,000 contract that we entered to, into with our board council. The board made a decision to hire a board council because there are so many attorneys on the bench, as you mentioned, and they all handled different things, but we felt there was some conflict with some of the attorneys that we had on board that were representing the superintendent president at the time, the district, HR, and we felt like we as a board didn't have adequate representation so we put that RFP out and had uh, attorney firms submit their proposals for board counsel. And we went for three months through the ringer to hammer out a $20,000 contract. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous to me, the language, the scope of work, the questions for, for a single item board counsel period. And then, you know, Three months later, we have a $200,000 contract and nobody even raises an eyebrow. And it's put on the agenda, not by a board member and it's not brought to the board and the rest of the board is not aware of it. And one board member is the one who brought it to the former superintendent president who was at the time under investigation. The optics are bad. So while I appreciate that you and your firm are doing your due diligence and doing your best to make sure that everything is transparent and open, on our side, somebody dropped the ball because there was no transparency and there was no openness. And this contract that was signed, you know, again, I'm actually waiting for a copy of the signed contract because I was told it was signed in December, but that could be inaccurate information. If it was in fact signed in January, the contract, the contract. Not, you know, how it might not look bad on you, but it certainly does look bad on the district. Who, who was the staff that you were working with? So the contract was signed on December 27th and the oh, So it was signed in December 27th. Okay, so ho hold on, hold on. Let's make sure we clarify that because earlier you told me that I was inaccurate with my information. So the contract was signed in December by you. $200,000 is not enough of a contract for you to take back to your firm and at least put it on a bulletin board or something to let them know, hey, Long Beach City College, remember when we showed up in September to respond to an RFP? Guess where, there is no dollar meeting. There is no dollar amount on the contract. There is no dollar amount on the contract. 
It is approved up to two hundred thousand dollars. That that, am that amount was not listed on the contract. So so the, so the way so the contract was initiated in the conversation, and we submitted it to you folks on December twenty seventh under her signature. Then that contract went to your staff. Uh, along the way, there were discussions about finalizing the contract. At some point, somebody on your end agreed to it. There was never any celebration to celebrate because there's nothing in any writing that says we have been awarded a $200,000 contract until such time as that went on the agenda. We were not even aware of it. So uh, I understand uh, I understand the, the optics and the perspective, but this is not a, a situation where where we were talking to folks at the district and that to negotiate a $200,000 contract. That is just not accurate. Okay, I, I understand. Who are, who are the uh, Maribel, that you were working with? I, I worked with Robert Raposa, who is the Director of Business Support Services and negotiating the contract terms. We were never notified of whatever dollar amount. Um, and again, because semantics matter, and they definitely matter when you're talking about the reputation of a law firm, nothing was clandestine. The contract that was uh, approved was negotiated again with your procurement office. The amount and the contract approval was placed on your agenda. Um, I don't know if every law firm whose legal services agreement for hundreds of thousands of dollars over the last several months, or as you said, since December, are going to be asked to respond, or, we, or as, as you're saying, the optics look like we've been singled out for whatever reason that may be. But the process that we followed is exactly the same process that the college has used for every uh, law firm. If that's not, we were there as you were having the discussion about the $25,000 in the process, and we've made recommendations on, you know, we weighed in on saying, you know, it should be streamlined and there's different, better practices to implement. Um, but to suggest that somehow it was clandestine or didn't properly follow the process that every single law firm that's been approved um, has gone through, I think is not is is, is frankly an uh, inaccurate uh, representation. Yeah. No, uh, Mayor Mayor Mayor, I, I haven't I haven't interrupted you, um, and I just want to say that the meeting was clandestine. The meeting certainly was clandestine. Is it customary for you to meet with a non office holding board member, not a non-titled board member, just a regular board member, superintendent, president who is under investigation. Is that, would you consider that normal? Well, because in, in my world, I would feel a need to disclose that. If I were just a sitting board member, I would feel very uncomfortable, but, but I have a different, uh, you know, the, the way I conduct myself is very differently. I would feel very uncomfortable having a meeting with the superintendent president who is currently under investigation as a board member without even so much as a courtesy email to the rest of the board, and then to have a $200,000 contract appear and be approved on the agenda, falling under HR, what, what, what business does a trustee and a superintendent have to even present an, you know, an HR legal contract? It just okay, excuse me, uh, President Malaulu. Since you're referring to me, let me just speak to this. Um, um, I point of I, order. Point of I, order. Point of order. Trustee Trust Baxter was. I recognize next. your point of order. Go ahead. Trustee Baxter was next in speaking. Just because it, there was some discussion about Trustee Dia, it doesn't seem she should jump the order of Trustee Baxter. I, I apologize. Um, I didn't see Trustee Baxter's hand up. Um, Thank you. After Trustee, Trustee Z, I'll Baxter. come right back to you. Trustee Baxter. No problem. I apologize. Actually, my hand was not up, and I think we're taking an incredible amount of time uh, over something that I, I don't know how to say this because I'm not an attorney, but um, I understand it, it doesn't look good. Uh, and I so I know where you're coming from, uh, President Malulu. Um, but I, I think these people were brought to lunch to meet the president and, uh, you know, anyway, this is quite a discussion. That's it. Okay, I, I'm sorry, Trustee Baxter. I do remember after Trustee Untuck had spoken that you, you had, I don't know if I misheard or attributed it to you, but, and now you're on I mute. I was scratching my nose. 
Okay, now you're on mute. Okay, Trustee Zia. Yes, I um, I don't think there's any um, thing inappropriate with a, a constituent reaching out to me. We're supposed to. Uh, may I give my cell phone out to the college uh, community and. You know, I don't think there's any harm or foul with meeting or greeting with um, with him. He requested an introduction. Um, I don't, I'm confused as to what you mean. What's the issue? What are you suggesting as far as the optics? I'm, I'm really, I'm really just scratching my head. They went through the process fair and square. They didn't lobby me for a contract, nor did I <laughs> tell the superintendent to give him a contract. It was simply a meet and greet after the board council interview, um, which I didn't vote for them. I voted for Mr. Ewing uh, and they didn't get that um, contract. And, and frankly, uh, I'd like to make the distinction that that contract was directly with the board. This is with the district. So it's, a, it's within the purview of management, the superintendent, president, whether former or present, um, to oversee that and administer that. It's not a, it's incumbent upon us as trustees to get into the negotiations. And the reason why um, other board members were not notified was it because Mr. Liao reached out to me and it would have been a Brown Act violation if other board members were to participate. And um, I think those are the, the questions that you have and I hope that uh, answers them. Well, um, if I just may respond, it would not have been a Brown Act violation to notify the board that you and the former superintendent president met for lunch with one of the attorneys that had been approved for our bench, as has been said, uh, it would have been a courtesy. It would have only been a Brown Act violation had there been three board members present. So you could have very easily had two board members present at that meeting and been fine. Um, as far as, you know, I, I, I can I ask a question about that? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sure. Um, but is, are, are you suggesting that every time we meet with constituents or um, people that approach us that we notify you and other board members? I just want to make sure because we don't have a policy that suggests that there's nothing in the uh, community college trustee ethics guidelines that say um, suggest that I'm just confused as what is what is the issue and um so here's the issue do better if you want to instill a policy we can certainly talk yeah. about that, but every time I'm so here's the issue i meet with constituents all the time but they don't result in two hundred thousand dollar contracts a month later so i think that there should be some regard for the board and some respect for the district that if you are meeting with the constituent who is going to receive a two hundred thousand dollar contract that that be known, it be made known. And especially, now again, and I'm gonna reiterate, and I understand what you said, that the board council that we hired, basically that we entered a contract with for $20,000 to serve as board council, that process was brutal. There was so much obstruction to that process. The language in that contract, considering when you compare the language in this contract and how quickly and easily and there was absolutely nobody shook anything for a $200,000 contract, it certainly does raise eyebrows. So while he might be your constituent and you wanna have lunch with him, you can have lunch with him every day, that's not a problem. But if you're gonna have lunch with him and then sneak a $200,000 contract in, that's a problem. And if well, I, 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 I can see how you could, uh, I understand what you're saying, President Malulu, and I just wanna um, provide you with um, the, the facts. And the facts are there was no intent to give an in contract. It was simply a meet and greet. Now, if the superintendent president decided to give a contract, I was not aware of that. Um, we just, I just mainly facilitated the introduction. I couldn't stay for the discussions, for the entirety of the discussions, but I think it's in a very unfair and inaccurate um, representation and characterization of what actually was the intent and what happened. Nobody went to the superintendent and said, give them a contract. Um, it was simply a meet and greet. And uh, as, as Maribel and Francisco stated, they were already pre-approved. They went through our vetting process. It wasn't something nefarious or unscrupulous and unsavory. They were vetted out, and you know they were one of the approved uh, vendors. So, if that's that's some that's a decision that is in the operations of the management um, purview of, um, frankly, uh, a superintendent and 
president and the negotiation that ensues after with our contracting department. I don't get involved in that. I don't think it's appropriate for us to get involved in that or even be involved in those discussions. Um, that's why I, uh, I, I think it's important for us to crystallize that. And now if you want, if you're say, say, say saying that it's, um, you know, if we have anybody reach out to us and we should inform the board, I don't have any policies or regulations that suggest that perhaps you can elucidate that for me. Well, there's a conflict of interest. What's there's the conflict? Ethics. There's, you know, Trustee Zia, this is a conversation that's been ongoing on this board, uh, certainly in the last two years. Um, ethics has different definitions to different people. Conflict of interest has different definition to different people. And some people are very comfortable crossing lines and pushing envelopes while others are not. And I, you know, like I said, I would feel very uncomfortable doing that making an introduction to the superintendent president or a legal counsel, she's under investigation, it's, an, it's a law firm and it falls under HR. Again, we're just kind of running around in circles and I understand Trustee Baxter's earlier concern. Um, you know, if you're, if you're okay with it and if it doesn't bother you and if that's how you operate, that's on you. But I think we have a responsibility to the district and we have a responsibility to have things out in the open. So again, um, you know, I don't. I don't want to keep going. Over President Matt Lulu, can I say? Just on tech. Yeah, um, you know, I appreciate um, the Leal firm coming, and and I actually had a meeting with Superintendent President uh, Bynum earlier this week and asked her to reach out to them uh, to make sure they they were here tonight, so we could at least give them the fairness of speaking for themselves. And I appreciate. I think they shared that. You know, they probably didn't have as much information or were in the dark as we were. Um, you know, and the question of what's the problem, I don't think it's the law firm. I think it was um, Trustee Zia and Reagan Romali. When you talk about conflict of interest, you immediately, we just had the meeting in December to finally hire the investigator. You know, Trustee Zia has made this, you know, public notice in the newspaper that she was the target of the investigation not disclosing the two people who are under investigation meeting with a law firm immediately after an investigator was hired is a conflict of interest. We don't need to rewrite a policy. That's an obvious violation of the policy. Is it the unbeknownst law firm's fault? No, but it's a responsibility of Trustee Zia and Reagan Romali. This is why Trustee Zia was censured in the past for this type of unethical behavior. She has failed to go through the training uh, to follow up on the direction of the board. We go back and forth. We can only hold ourselves accountable. Uh, and this is another example of Trustee Zia crossing the line. And it's very clear conflict of interest. And, you know, the other thing is we are in a budget crunch. We are trying to negotiate with our uh, staff groups. Uh, we're looking for money everywhere. And, you know, we just can't afford to have a an open-ended $200,000 contract that honestly nobody can give a straight answer. Uh, after the last meeting, Vice President Drinkwine did not follow up with the guarantees of providing information. Vice President Durant could not remember all of a sudden how this contract uh, was, was made and it was for an HR issue. Now he couldn't remember. There's so many unanswered questions. I think we just uh, have to um, set this contract aside um, even though I, it's, I don't think it's the, the law firm's fault, they're just, this was part of all the problems that were going on on campus under the former leadership. And again, another crossing line by Trustee Zia that um, I don't feel, I mean, I, I feel it's, it's really a necessity of the board to terminate this contract. And, you know, it doesn't mean we can't work with the firm again in the future, but right now it's just, I agree with you, the optics are bad. It doesn't add up. We can't get a clear answer from anybody. And I don't think we should have the, an open-ended, you know, $200,000 contract um, here, you know, uh, on campus. So I, I'd like to just make a motion. We can move on and we can still have more discussion, but I'd like to make, make a motion to uh, terminate the contract effective uh, um, the Section 9 of the contract which would require us to pay any outstanding invoices 
um, and start the process. And we'll respect anything that you decide. We'll, we'll respect any, anything that you decide, um, uh, board uh, board member. But um, we just we just would like to say, um, you know, we mentioned the word um, the um, left optics of Sorry. it. And the optics, Mar Maribel. Thank you, Maribel. Hold on. hang on one second. I don't think Trustee Antep had concluded his remarks. Sorry. I yes. Thank you. Thank you, Maribel. Um, just I would just close that that motion. Ask for a second. Okay. We have a motion on the floor to terminate the contract under Section Nine of the contract to pay out any outstanding invoices. Is there a second? Okay, hearing none, the motion dies. I have one additional question for staff. Um, I'm not really sure who would respond to this, um, if it would be Jean or Marlene or, um, you know, perhaps, you know, I, I don't know who would respond to this, but what was the conveyed purpose of this contract? I, I know that we had, there were some emails that went back and forth asking questions in preparation for tonight's meeting, but, you know, for it to fall under HR, what was the conveyed purpose of this contract? Yeah. Or, or did our former superintendent president actually, you know, present any purpose to the executive team at all? Can I, can I preface that before, and I will turn it over to Vice President Duran. Um, you know, some contracts don't have dollar amounts. They just have a contract that is entered into with the district. And if they don't have dollar amounts, then they show up as a ratification item under the board for $200,000 or less. And um, I'll ask uh, Vice President Duran to speak to this, but it's my guess that this is what happened. It was a contract that was signed by the district. It was signed by um, uh, Francisco and Maribel and their firm. And then it had to show up on a ratification list. If it were a contract for something over 200,000, it would be an individual item. But in this case, um, you know, we often do contracts like that because they may end up being multi-year contracts. But um, I'm presuming this is what happened in this case, but I will ask Doc, uh, Vice President Duran to speak to this, please. Thank you. Um, you know, to... I do recall having conversations about this particular firm. I actually, I do, I don't. It was actually back in January. Recall the specifics. Um, I do remember. I actually have been reminded um, that there was some conversations with the then president superintendent, but I frankly have no recollection of the specifics as to what particular HR uh, issue or potential issue that may come up uh, that this was related to. Um, there are often conversations where things come up. We have a conversation about, do, are we gonna bring in legal counsel and then figure out which legal mm -hmm. counsel. But the particulars, I, I do, I frankly do not uh, recollect at all. And then can I ask uh, Vice President um, Drinkwine to respond to this as well? Because um, it's my understanding that Bob Raposa, who is in her area, um, affected the contract at the direction of um, former President um, Ramali, but um, Marlene, could you speak to that, please? Certainly, thank you. Yes, um, Bob Raposa was directed by Dr. Ramali to enter into a contract with Alan Trejo. Um, as a member of what we are calling the bench, the bench being all the law firms that responded to our request for qualifications and met those qualifications, Applications. Um, from that point forward, any legal firm we brought on board would have been from that list and exclusively only from that list. Um, so Bob was asked to bring them on board for a contract without specification of a specific case. Um, it is our practice to um, have that $200,000 limit um, for ratification for, um, in this case, it was for a three year term. Um, no expenses were incurred. Um, we did not direct Leon Trejo to this point to do any work. Um, and that is uh, the, the status of the contract at this point. I, I understand and I appreciate all three of you weighing in. So basically there was no purpose that was conveyed to have this contract ratified. Is that correct? 
And and I understand that you said that um, Bob is the person is, is um, I'm trying to remember, is it Alan who still does contracts? Is he still the one? Because I remember that he's very meticulous. I, right. Yes. Um, if I could clarify, uh, Bob Raposa is our director of business support services. Alan Maloney um, is one of his managers and over contracts. Um, but Bob did negotiate directly with um, Lee Allen Trejo to get our standard clauses that protect the district's inser um, interest inserted into the contract. Got it. Okay. So, so uh, our former superintendent president was the one who initiated the ratification of this contract. Actually agendizing and adding this particular firm, taking them off the bench, putting them into our working queue, so to speak, so that they could begin to handle issues in HR. That's that's how that happened? Correct. No specific purpose conveyed. So is that why the contract, and you know, maybe ambiguous is not the right word that I'm looking for, but is that why the contract was so vague and, um, kind of slid through the process, whereas the previous contract, it was, you know, such such a hard process for $20,000. Yeah, yes, Ms. Bynum? I, I don't under, I don't know anything about the 20,000 for Mr. Ewing, but um, I know that, that contracts sometimes will say for specific HR services, or they will say um, to do district business and, um, and in fact, um, Vice President Drinkwine and her team are working to um, to tighten up, I think, our contract and our language in terms of scope, because I think it's important that a contract does give as much scope as possible so it's understood what the contract will be for. And we've had discussions about that with the team. Okay, and last question, is it normal? Is it is it customary for the superintendent president to go straight to Bob? for a contract and then, you know, have Bob get it to Alan or does it usually go through, you know, a certain process? Cause it just, I've just never heard that before, but you know, that doesn't mean anything. Is, is that customary for the superintendent? So again, we go back to the optics of it. There's a certain level of influence that a trustee has. So I'm gonna put myself in the equation. If I were to make an introduction of a vendor to our current superintendent, it and say here I just want to do a meet and greet but I have to get back to work the two of you guys here meet and greet and talk about minority services and then a month later go ahead and you know slide a two hundred thousand dollar contract in is that customary for Ms. Bynum to go directly to Bob and say go ahead and give a contract come on put them on the agenda so that if any HR work pops up we can just go ahead and delegate it to them is that I'm I'm relatively new. That wouldn't be my process. Um, I don't know if if uh, Vice President Drinkwine was not around at the time and she wanted it done, then she might have done that. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Arlene, do you have any reaction? Thank you. Um, at the time that the initial direction was given, um, Superintendent President Bynum is correct. I was out of the office. Um, I will say that um, the direction to entertain entering into a contract with the new firm um, would have been researched. We would have made sure that it was um, appropriate to work with that firm. And in this case, since this firm did indeed meet all the qualifications and was placed on the bench, um, their um, this firm was pre-qualified to provide services to the district. And for that reason, we could move forward with the contract. Okay. I understand. Trustee Untag, do you have anything else? Um, yeah, you know, I just interested in resolution of the process today. I mean, I, I know you, this was your agenda item request, uh, President Malulu, and, and, and we didn't hear from Trustee Otto, but I don't know what's a, a resolution that we can get to today. Trustee Otto? Yeah, um, I, I know, uh, or I have met uh, both members of this firm. They have great reputations as attorneys in the legal community in Long Beach. And um, uh, I think uh, that it was important to vet these 
issues because the issues are not about this law firm whatsoever. Uh, this law firm was looking for business just like lawyers do. And, um, uh, and yet there's something that, uh, th this is an outcropping with a board problem. And the board problem is, does this board work together? Do they try and uh, reach resolutions to policy issues? Or uh, is the trust so damaged that uh, it doesn't work very effectively or it does not work effectively at all? And uh, I, think, I think I've explained that my point of view is that it has and uh, that we ought to be doing all we can to get together as a board and work with one another because without the trust, um, uh, we're not doing our work. We're not doing what we were elected to do and we're not doing what's in the best interest of our students. And uh, so um, I, I, it, it's appropriate to bring these issues forward. It's appropriate to talk about the issues. I didn't second uh, um, uh, Udawak's uh, motion because um, I thought there might be a taint on it that was undeserved by this law firm. Uh, like they had done something wrong and I don't think they've done anything wrong. And uh, uh, you know, I, I thought about, well, maybe we can terminate it and then put them back. I mean, and then I thought, no, let's, let's move on. Let's get to what we really need to do, which is to work as a board together to do what we're supposed to do. Yeah, I appreciate that. Trustee Baxter, did you want to add anything? Trustee Zia? Oh. No, I, I, um, I think uh, Luann has her hand up, but I, I agree with um, Trustee Otto. And I just want to make sure, because there have been um, references made that are errant and erroneous. There is no conflict of interest. There is no financial interest that I have. Um, the uh, Leal Trio never contributed to my campaign. They may, you know, support others, but there is nothing that um, is even a reception of a conflict of interest. And as far as the investigation that uh, was referenced at the time, I did not know um, about the investigation into me, if that's what Trustee Intuck is talking about. I learned about it through the press in March when I got a call. I didn't even know what it was about nor did I see it agendized um, or noticed for a um, decision and a vote. So um, it is definitely inaccurate to suggest that. And um, I don't think there's any harm and foul. And if, uh, if someone wants to meet and greet, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, if, if we want to change that, um, I'm certainly happy to work with the board and put in measures in place that is clear, crystal clear for all board members. So we don't get into this business of pointing fingers and um, disparaging uh, our fellow board members. And um, I, I too really want to work with the rest of you and making sure that we repair any um, uh, anything that needs to be uh, repaired in the breach of trust, if there is any. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tristan, um, uh, I just, I know, uh, Ms. Bynum, go ahead, you're right. Ms. Yes. No, I just want to uh, clarify, um, you know, our contract and purchasing department are about as tight and solid gold, I think, as they can possibly be. So, um, you know, they were doing the direction that they were given, and if there were anything untoward, um, uh, they would have, they would have, brought it to someone's attention. But as far as the contract itself went and the process for the contract and the initiation of it and all of that, um, you know, they, I'm sure they did the same thing and saw that there wasn't really anything wrong with it. It was just a directive given to them and they checked it out like they check out any other contract. I understand. Uh, Trustee Antuck, uh, uh, the reason why I didn't second your motion is because the term of the contract already ended. So there was really no need to terminate the contract because I believe that the the term was um, was already had already concluded. And as far as you know, with the exception of um, some inaccuracies in the chronology and the timeline, and you know what people remember and and what actually happened, um, I just would like to see that in the future, and we've talked about this before, that board members do not act unilaterally, that we do have re the respect that we talk about. It's easy to talk the talk, but to actually walk the walk is a whole different subject. But um, if we do want to talk about respect, that we have the same level of respect for each other um, and, and not work unilaterally and, and do things collaboratively and make sure that 
there is transparency and accountability and everyone is aware. Um, I, you know, what didn't know about it then to have felt any slight at the time to not have been included. But I also understand um, that, you know, it was a, it was a difficult time. Uh, so, you know, I could understand why I wasn't told about it, but out of, out of respect for the position as board president, I do think that there needs to be some awareness and at least some disclosure. And again, we get back to, you know, personal boundaries that people feel comfortable crossing or staying within. So trustee Untuck, if, if you don't have anything else, we can move just on. One, I, I, just quickly. Um, one, I, I thought the contract was for three years. So if it's expired, I think that's new. I know the purchase order date was different each month and it's on the purchase order for this month again, even though if it, I don't know if, if it in fact expired in February of uh, 2020, maybe Marlene knows if the contract expired or is still active. I thought she said it was for three years. It was approved. Thank you, trustee and took it was approved for a term of three years. Um, however, the, um, this contract um, is for services on demand, meaning that the firm has no specific assignment until we make that assignment to the firm. So therefore there is no charges incurred at this point, nor is there any um, outstanding assignments for the firm. So um, at this point, no services have been rendered, no cost is due. Um, the contract does contain a clause where we can cancel the contract with them and they can in turn cancel the contract with us with or without cause. Um, however, uh, it is up to the board's discretion whether to allow the contract to remain um, or to terminate. One, one follow-up question. Um, so it's on there for 200000 even though there was no amount in the contract, which is a public document on the February agenda, even though it was the very last consent calendar item. Uh, Marlene, do we, so now that the 200,000 is on the purchase order, does that include it in our budget now? Because it's Correct. legal services? Correct, it is included in the budget and um, any amounts at the end of the year that are unspent in a contract roll over so they would appear as a positive impact to our ending fund balance and roll over into the next year. Um, as you can imagine, legal fees are um, a large portion, particularly of our HR budget. Also, um, we have expenditures for them typically within our bond program and within our contracts program. Um, and those amounts that we assign to those contracts allow us to have continued representation in any cases that might flow from one fiscal year to another fiscal year. Um, and if for some reason those amounts um, are not sufficient to cover that amount of the contract, because that $200,000 is the limit for ratification, any expansion would need to come back to the board explicitly for your pre-approval and it's at that point that we typically provide to you what we have used the contract for and what cases are outstanding that would require us to expand the amount. Hey, and then uh, another follow-up question. I know when we were having the, the conversation about the um, original board contract for last year, I want to say in September, Marlene, you said that we were gonna we were gonna have to take the money from reserves and we were not going to be able to budget $20,000. Is that still the case? What is true is that um, both HR um, and those two other areas I mentioned have existing budget for legal fees. It is something that we budget for on a regular basis. Um, the board had not, to my understanding, having been here for two years and previous to that, had not had an explicit budget for legal fees that because the board had not before retained counsel expressly to represent the board, there had never been a budget established. And so when you retained counsel, we had to establish a new budget for you and you decided to have that limited to $20,000. But HR 
had pre-existing budget that they were able to utilize for this contract. Um, I, I have a quick question, Marlene. Um, this month's agenda item, there's a purchase order listing under section 6, 6.13. And that one I believe has a term for this contract from January 28th, 2020 until February 26, 2020. Is that, is that incorrect? Is that reported incorrectly? That represents the intent of um, HR as well as contracts that based on the absence of a specific assignment for the firm to not assign any assignments to the firm. So the relationship between a contract and a PO is interesting. Um, and it's different than if you just issue a PO, for instance, to buy office supplies, because then the PO contains the entirety of that agreement. It specifies what you're buying from a specific firm. But when you have a contract, the contract is that guiding document. The PO issuance is used primarily just to affect payment. And so our um, contract staff, our procurement staff, will process those POs as they can. They have to process the ones definitely quickly to purchase items, but for a contract, they process it as their workload allows, but definitely have to process when an invoice is presented. Um, and I think that Ms. Medina mentioned that she was a surprised to see a PO since they hadn't presented an invoice our team was catching up on the issuance of POs for contracts. So I wanted to explain that, just to explain the difference between a contract as the guiding document versus a PO, which is used to affect payment. So in this case, the contract specifies our term and the um, expiration of that PO at the end of February um, is a reflection of our team's understanding that we would not be assigning any um, any cases to the firm for this fiscal year. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Anything else on this item? I, I just wanted to clarify, um, President Malulu, that, that, that it wasn't um, expired, that I, the contract still goes on and, and the amount, that I think we're all clear on that. Also, I just, again, um, ask trustees, you know, Zia, like if we're going to have a, productive relationship and you talk about wanting to work with the board members, you have to be honest because you were in the meetings in October, November, and December where the discussion and investigation, including you, was there. So to allege you didn't know at the end of December that you were included or you found out from the media uh, is really a, 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 a falsehood and um, undermines building trust uh, with all of us. And I, I think it does a disservice to the board and to the community and to the college um, when you're just not honest with the rest of us. Yeah, I, I think I think we have established timelines of discussions and conversations. Um, thank you. If there is nothing else on this item, I'd like to move on the agenda to, and, and thank you to Francisco and Maribel. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here with us. <laughs> Appreciate the information. Uh, I also concur with what trustee Otto uh, stated that it wasn't as much as a reflection on you as it was as a reflection on the way the district operated and did business at that time. And uh, we, we want to make sure that we clarify that also. Appreciate it. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. Uh, moving on to section six on the agenda, which is the consent agenda. Does anybody have any item that they'd like to... Um, Hold out on the agenda. We removed uh, 6.3. Okay. Just for clarification. Okay. And I'm going to need help um, from somebody, maybe uh, Vice President Drinkwine, because I printed everything out, but unfortunately my workspace is a little cluttered. I don't know which item this is on the agenda, but I did want to ask a question about the C2C program. Does anybody know off the top of its head? Because I've got it here. And then I also wanted to ask one additional question about a contract. Um, I, we have several consultant contracts on the agenda. And 
The only one that I wanted to ask for was the one with, um, and it's just a minor question. I just don't know which number they are. It's the one with um, Ron Beeler with the um, facilities planning and program services. Let me take a quick look and take a look at that. I believe it's 6.11 ratification of contracts equal to or under $200,000, but let me confirm. And I'm sorry, I, when I printed them, it, you know, of course they printed in order, but I, I got them out of order, so. And then Trustee, Ma, I mean, President Malulu? Yes. I, I, I was gonna recommend pulling 6.11 uh, the contracts and that's 6.13 the purchase orders and it is item 6.8 on contract awards that contains the contract for FPPS and that is uh, represented by Ron Beeler um, he is our contract with that firm so again 6.8 for bond contract awards um, and you asked about the, the contract C2C. with that again will be the um, item trustee into just reference 6.11 the ratification okay. of contracts equal to or under perfect thank you very much i appreciate that yeah uh madam secretary i just want to verify i have removed for uh separate action 6.3 6.8 6.11 and 6.13 is that correct that's correct Thank you. And so uh, now you can take I, a motion on consent items. Okay, I, I think Trustee Otto wanted to say something. Yeah, I just wanted to move the remainder of the non removed consent items uh, approval for approval. Yes, we only moved your item uh, the 3.3 out, not 6.3. 6.3, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I, so, what I'm saying is I'm moving approval of all the items that have not been removed by me or anybody else. Second. Oh, you're Okay, we've got a motion and a second to approve the consent items with the exception of items 6.3, 6.8, 6.11, 6.11, and 6.13. Yeah. Any discussion on that? Okay, Madam Secretary, roll call vote, please. Jenna Jimenez. Aye. Trustee. Uh, Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduak Joe Intuk. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. So now let's go back and revisit item 6.3. And that was at the request of Trustee Otto on that holdout. Yeah, and, and here's my purpose for removing this. Um, I got a call from a constituent today about the monies for um, that we're doing for college homelessness and colleges and homeless uh, and, and housing insecurity. And so I called, I mean, because if you, if you look at 6.3, it says that there is a... Um, Three hundred thousand dollars that we're that we have this year for that, and four hundred thousand dollars that's proposed for that. And what my constituent said was, "It's a lot of money." Well, you guys are in the education business; you're not in the in the social services business. Um, what is this? So I did what I would do when I have questions. I called uh, Miss Drinkwine, and uh, and she explained it. And I thought it would be helpful for not only my constituent, but as it was for me, but for other people to understand what this is, that's all. Okay, thank you. And uh, item 6.8, oh, excuse me, we need to take a vote on it, but he, uh, trustee- I, I was asking if she could explain what this means. Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. I thought you were just making a, an opinion. <laughs> thank you, so this is a state funded um, program um, that we did recently win the award for. Um, the totality of the amount is $700,000. A portion of that is in the unrestricted general fund and a portion of that is in the financial aid fund to represent how we utilize those. Um, it is a restricted grant. And so we were lucky enough to win the award and the award must be used for the purposes of the grant, which is to serve the homeless and the housing insecure. Um, 
it is for the current budget year. Um, we are um, unsure if the funding will continue in the next budget year. Um, there are proposed to be large reductions to several restricted programs that the state um, previously supported. Um, but we are lucky enough to have these funds in the current year and they are being spent under the administration of Dr. Munoz and his team. Good. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Madam Secretary, do we need to vote on that item before we go on to the other ones? Yes, we do. I move okay. approval. Thank you. I would move approval. Second. Second. Okay, we've got a motion by Trustee Otto, second by Trustee Zia. Any discussion? Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to just um, really um, thank Trustee Otto for um, crystallizing this item um, and making sure there's no ambiguity about it. And thanks staff for working hard to secure the funding um, and make sure our students that are the most vulnerable are being taken care of. I want to applaud you, Mike. I know you've been really supportive on this front and really have done tremendous on that uh, and in making sure that it's a substantive support. And um, I just wanted to thank staff and uh, thank all those that were involved in this case to making sure that we get real meaningful support for our homeless uh, students and students who are dealing with housing insecurity. Thank you. Madam Secretary, roll call vote, please. Student Trustee Jimenez? Aye. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduwak Joe Inta? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. And Sunny Zia? Aye. Motion carries. Moving on to item 6.8, that's the one that I held out on. I just have a question, um, actually, to just to clarify, this is bond money, correct, Vice President Drinkwine? Okay, and then what number of contract is this for FPPS? This is a renewal of their contract. They had previously responded to a bid process to get big a bid process, excuse me, to get the initial um, contract. Um, we have been incredibly satisfied with the services that they've provided. Um, you will actually be presented with at the next board meeting um, the results of their work in this fiscal year with the preparation of our applications to the state for funding. And if you'll recall, we have been approved for three projects recently for funding. Um, they also help us um, create and um, put together our five-year facilities plans. And so, um, like I said, incredibly satisfied with their services, um, been very responsive, um, and um, we have been able to obtain millions of dollars from the state for those bond projects with their support. Okay, so this is just an extension of their first contract? Correct, correct. And this would be for an additional three years and at the conclusion of those three years I would recommend that we go out and bid. Um, while I am always supportive of an extension of a contract when we had exemplary service, I think it's also wise to not continue to extend that contract over and over again and occasionally do rebid to ensure that we have competitive pricing. Okay, got it. And then how just you know I thought of one other question as you were speaking, but um, and I know that our bond program is gigantic and it's there's a lot of layers to it but how many actual contracts do we have i know that there's the project manager and then there's other different layers on there but approximately how many contracts and are they all on a renewal basis or are they um we extend them or we you know put out bid requests for each one you are correct and that is a very complex program we have a mix of all of the above we have some contracts that are with specific firms such as Cordoba or FPPS that are for specific services for a specific term and that we pay on. But when we start thinking about our construction projects, we go out to bid for several portions of those projects. So we would go out to bid for the general contractor or for the architect or for any of those services um, that are above the bid limit. And for most of our projects, they're above the bid limit. But with a general contractor, our contract with them is for their services. They in turn contract with their subcontractors in many cases. Um, in some cases, depending on the bid limit, again, we have to contract directly with them. So you have a series of different 
levels of contracts that are very complex. I would have to come back to you in the future with the total number that we currently have, um, but that number will increase. That as we um, look at the kinesiology lab and aquatic center, as we start looking at building M, um, I don't think it's hyperbole to say that we have one of the largest bond programs that are currently active statewide with the largest number of projects that are currently being undertaken. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, so um, I, I'm good with that. Uh, if anybody would make a motion to approve item 6.8. 6 so moved. Second. We have a motion by Trustee Zia, and I believe that was student trustee with the second? Yes. And I will need a trustee also for second. Um, the, uh, second. Okay, Trustee Otto with the second. Any discussion? All those, oh, Madam Secretary, roll call vote, please. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduak Joe Intuck. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. Motion carries. And now we're going to move on to item 6.11. And was that one mine? <laughs> I don't have an I, I don't have a contract number on what I printed out. Was that for it, it included both the item you wanted and the item I want to talk about? Okay, mine will be really quick, Trustee Untuck, if I may. Um, so mine is regarding the C2C program, and uh, I, I would direct this question to Vice President Munoz. And I also want to apologize to Vice President Drinkwine and Vice President Munoz because I don't like surprises, and usually I try to be on top of it and ask the questions in advance, but, you know, just blame COVID, but I have, there's no more time in the days that I already didn't have time on. So I'm sorry I ran out of time. I would have either asked you directly before or what, but um, Vice President Munoz, I have a question regarding C2C, and I know that we can't really get too in depth of it, but um, you and I had worked on this and talked about it for some time, and there were some issues, and you had mentioned that there would be some changes and I just wanted to know if those changes are reflected in this new contract and maybe if you can briefly describe what they are. And, and if I may, um, you you'd stated that some of the changes were uh, to make the program a little bit more student friendly and a little more accessible to, um, I don't remember if it was students or their families, but if you can clarify that for me, I'd really appreciate it. Sure. Well, um, to just provide some historical backdrop, C2C is not a new program. It's a program that has been well established here um, at Long Beach City College for quite some time. But administratively, it was housed under the foundation. And so it was really a foundation program, but it had the Long Beach City College logo and kind of interfacing in terms of um, being seen as a Long Beach City College program and how it interfaced with the community, with service providers, with students, and with families. And so what we kind of were able to identify um, within the last, I would say probably in the last 12 months, as some issues were identified and concerns were brought forward to us, um, that there was a need to really have tighter internal controls um, with the program so that we can ensure that we are supporting our families and our students um, as effectively as we can. And it's not to say that they weren't being um, supported or served effectively prior. It's just that like in any kind of program that you have, especially programs that have um, compliance matters around compliance, as well as um, expectations of service, you know, you need to have strong um, program management and strong internal controls. And so the recommendation was to, to move the program back over to the college side. Um, not that the foundation wasn't doing their job. They've been great partners through this but really to make sure that we streamline and create that full integration between the CTC program, as well as other services that we provide um, through the, that are contracted or provided to us through the Harbor Regional Center, um, to bring those support services and house them within student services, to house them within student services, and to have them be um, more, uh, more integrated within the DSPS program as well as more integrated within student services as a whole. So it was really an attempt to streamline, break down any barriers that could exist um, because the program was not necessarily housed within student services previously. 
It was a foundation program. So that's essentially what we're looking at and kind of what I think has brought us to where we are right now. Perfect, thank you. I appreciate you clarifying that. And I also wanna commend you on the leadership that you took um, for this process. I, I appreciate that. I know that it, it wasn't easy. Um, and I'm glad, Trustee Baxter, that you have your hand up because I was gonna ask you a question too. Um, <laughs> what do you want? Do you want to answer me the question first or do you want me to make a comment first? No, go ahead. I, I think you. I think your comment might actually be related to what okay. I was asking. Uh, uh, Dr. Munoz said something that was incorrect. He said, bring it back to the college. The reason the foundation took over this program is because the college didn't want it. And I felt it was a wonderful program. It is a wonderful program. And so it was not a question of the foundation taking something from the college. It was a question of the college deciding uh, in their good judgment to uh, house the program. It's an outstanding program. And um, I'm very proud of, of what they do to help uh, uh, our students. So does that answer your question? Or you have another question. That, that actually wasn't the question that I was going to ask, but it, it's a it's a pretty good lead into the question that I was going to ask. So um, initially, I know that there was some issue with the um, salary allocation or or the source of funding for you know whatever the title is of the person in charge, if it's executive director or director. But um, I know that there was a split. I don't remember the amount, if it was 80, 20, or 75, 25, but I know that the college paid some, or maybe there was a time split. Maybe there was a- There was a time split. There was time split. Of money. Okay, the time split is what I'm thinking of. Has that issue been resolved? Has that position become full-time um, without a split in time? So I'm sure. I apologize, Trustee No, Baxter. go ahead, Dr. Munoz. So um, at this point, the, the administration of the, of the program, we have um, kind of some shared responsibilities. And so we, um, while we go through this contract negotiation process, once the contract's fully executed, we will be hiring a full-time program manager um, who will be dedicated 100%. And so that's built into this new contract agreement. So this current kind of, um, so currently the program as it's being implemented today is still housed under the foundation. So we're under that previous model. Mm -hmm. There have been some adjustments that have been made um, around the supervision of the program where we are engaging our director of DSPS with some responsibilities. There's mm -hmm. also someone that has been historically working on the grant that's still engaging with supporting the program. Um, but as we move the program to the college, there will be a full-time program manager hired to provide support services and oversight for the program. That will be built into this new contract that will start, or I shouldn't say contract, but this new agreement that will start July 1st. And, and that was the wish of the Harbor Regional people. Mm -hmm. They wanted a full-time executive director. So uh, you're in alignment with what they want. And I think that that may have also been the root of some of the issues that uh, were discovered too. I think that there, there was kind of a right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing at the time. So hopefully this will make it a lot easier and more student uh, service oriented and friendly. So uh, Vice President, Dr. Munoz, thank you very much. I, I appreciate you weighing in on this kind of at the last minute. Chair and Malibu, can I ask a question as well? Yes, Trustee Zia. Um, I just wanna make sure that there's no, I, I mean, I've heard this, but I wanna check the veracity of the information. Um, by moving C2C back or moving it, uh, transitioning it under um, the college, um, will there be any cuts to the current staff? I just want to make sure that, um, you know, because I've heard that, the, that that's been kind of the talk. Um, I just want to make sure that doesn't happen or perhaps maybe that was a rumor, but I wanted to ask you and verify the veracity of the information. Can you uh, speak to that, Mike? So since, as we all know, Long Beach City College is a public agency, and so we can't do appointments. And so right by moving the program to Long Beach, you know, to the college and having its operations be within the college, we actually will have to open up and do recruitments for the positions. Um, so we have, not, you know, Noel, our Dean Coral, has been really good and, and very providing some high touch and having had, has had some meetings 
with the C2C um, employees and letting them know what the process will be to apply for these positions. And so, we, like I said, because we do not have the ability as a public agency to just appoint people into positions, we have to post the positions, they have to apply, we have to go through our, um, as our um, hiring process as outlined, as outlined in our contracts, as outlined in our on board policies and administrative regulations. So it's not to say that, um, you know, the, that the C2C employees are being let go and they're not gonna be able to work in the program anymore, but they will have to apply for, the, you know, reapply for these positions. And unfortunately, there isn't really any way around that given the nature of being a public agency. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, Trustee Untuck, I thought it was gonna be a, a lot shorter than what it was. So go on to your item 6.11. Yeah, I um, was looking at the, you know, this is the issue uh, the Trejo firm brought up. Uh, we have two $200,000 contracts to the same firm, which ex together exceed um, uh, the amount of the two hundred thousand dollar limit, and you know these are extended also from now for the next three years. I did hear Miss Drinkwine say she uh, we typically talk about this, and and it's explained. And uh, well, even though this is on um, consent calendar, um, maybe uh, I don't know if she's the right person or someone else can answer why uh, one firm is getting four hundred thousand dollars in contracts over the $200,000 limit. What is the, this is the Atkinson, Anderson, Lawyer, Rude, and Romo contract 997-83.6 and 997-83.7 on page three of the uh, summary. But also the contracts are attached. Yes, thank you. Um, for these two contracts, each contract is very explicit in the types of services we are contracting with them. Unlike the Leal and Trejo, which was very general and would have covered any of those areas for which they had been pre-qualified, these two contracts are very explicit in that one is expressly for human resources and the other is specifically for business support services. Business support services, um, would include um, both bond-related services as well as uh, um, the support to revisit our standard contract language. So because they are discrete contracts separate from one another, you see two separate contracts because the services that we are getting from them are very explicitly in two different areas. So should the HR portion of that need to be expanded, say we had a couple of very expensive cases, then that would come back to the board for the approval, the explicit approval, not a ratification for that portion. And the same is true that if the other contract, if business support services exceeded that, it would come back to you for approval. But in this case, we would not be able to charge to the human resources contract any services performed for business support services. You wouldn't see any kind of cross-departmental charging under this contract. You would only see HR charges under their contract and then business services charges under that contract. They are discrete and separate from one another. Can you share with us the bidding process that you went through? to select uh, these firms? AALRR for short, um, Atkinson, Anderson, Loya, Rood, and Romo for long, um, also was on that pre-qualification list. They, like every other firm that we would enter into a contract with um, at this point, would have had to respond to that um, request for qualifications and would have had an examination to determine that they did indeed meet those qualifications. That the a bidding process is not required for these types of services. That's why we do the RFQ to ensure that whatever firm we do contract with did meet those um, qualifications. So just to confirm, they had to be on the list uh, that we approved last year, I think maybe last spring or summer. And then um, 
then we just have to enter into a contract with them. Correct. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Is there, isn't there, is there a policy related to the $200,000 threshold? Correct. In that policy, in that $200,000 threshold is set by a procurement code. And our policy states that um, instead of stating the specific dollar amount, it references back to that procurement code. That amount is typically not increased annually, but rather is typically revisited in the code every few years to reflect the impact of inflation. No, I'm sorry. Um, I, I believe there's a there's a policy on the you know the two hundred thousand dollar threshold versus over two hundred thousand. Correct, correct, and and that's what I was referencing. You do have a board policy that references the limit for ratification versus board approval, and that policy references back to that procurement code rather than a dollar limit. So that as the procurement code is updated, you don't have we don't have to bring the um, call the board policy back to you for approval that it just follows the code um as that code is updated so if we if this item had not been, been pulled today we wouldn't have talked about these items and it just would have been on consent calendar a new four hundred thousand dollars for three years extension i'm sorry could you say that one more time you know one of the things you said earlier is we typically uh put contracts like this on the agenda we talk about it uh it goes through the normal process yet if we had not pulled this from consent calendar there would have been no discussion or explanation of the contracts that is correct okay, okay trustee Antar, do you have any additional questions on that item no, I was able to get my answer, my question answered. Okay, thank you. So now we need a motion and a second to approve 6.11, please. Second. All right, we've got a motion by Trustee Otto, second by Trustee Baxter. Any discussion? Madam Secretary, if you could please take roll call vote, please. And Trustee Jimenez. Aye. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Vivian Mala Uta? Aye. Uduak Joe Intuck? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. And Sunny Zia? Nay. Okay, the motion passes. And the final item that was held out is 6.13, and that was by Trustee Untuck. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to follow up on this from last month. You know, we had pulled the Erickson contract um, that was at that last month's agenda $800,000. And then there was some email traffic that, oh, that was a mistake. Um, I don't know who the mistake was by. And it's smaller now, but um, it's back again without explanation from last month on the Erickson contract and the amount. So, I don't know which staff members can speak to um, the Erickson Law Firm, which is on page 54 of the purchase order. It's now 500000 instead of 800000 I can start off if, if um, I may, uh, Trustee Ann When I first looked at... Where's that coming from? Where's that coming from? You have, a, you have an echo, Ms. Bynum. Sorry, Jim, Jim, turn that off, turn it off. Oh, how's that? Is that okay? Yeah. yeah um, when I looked at it the first time, I, after I, um, you were, I was appointed, probably in the first week I started looking at legal contracts, I got a question about them, and I had calculated a uh, $500,000 total. I don't know where the 800 came from, but it is 500. They've been under contract since 2016 to do a number of um, services for uh, human resources. 
but you know they've been a long time contractor working with the district and um, I can refer um, Dr. I mean, Vice President Duran can talk a little bit more about it, but it never was 800,000 to begin with. It was 500, and it was just a matter of increasing contracts as their services were used throughout the years. So they've had actually six years worth of service for the 500,000. Uh, Vice President Duran, do you want to add anything to that? I, I think you explained it pretty clearly, um, other than the fact that Erickson Law Firm is um, well known throughout the state for their work with uh, community colleges, only works with community colleges, and, and is a firm that we rely on regularly for um, expert advice in personnel matters and contract matters. Got it, Trustee Antec, does that answer your questions? Um, well, one other thing, it appears they're the only law firm now who uh, did not go through the process and was approved on the list last year, yet we continue to have legal services with. And, so, uh, and but then, you know, Marlene was just saying that's the normal process for the Ackleson lawyer and red contract. That's the process that the Al firm um, was able to get their contract, yet this firm did not participate in that process did not respond to the RFP, yet um, keeps getting fairly large, a couple hundred thousand dollars in work. Well, like I said, they have been on, they've been um, contracted with us since 2016. And I'm not, I'm not sure, is your process that you went through last year for any and all kinds of legal contracts that we have? Or was it limited to legal? No, it was, it was all types. Um, it, it if was, I uh, may. If I made the, the Erickson contract um, went was a five year contract from 2016 to 2021. So it's not a new contract or a new extension um, since the adoption of the RFQ list. Rather, it was pre um, it, it predated that list, and we have not um, extended the length of the term of that contract since the RFQ list was released. Is this is this report generated manually, or how, how is this report generated? The PO report is generated from a system. Um, it is an immense PO system. The error that had been present in there on the previous report was an input error into the system that we have since corrected. So the, the PO report is automated unless somebody manually goes in and enters an error? Well, the, the PO report is always automated. It is always generated um, based on a query we've entered, but the data gets into the system through an input, and the input from the PO was um, just off. It was um, an error in that initial digit that was then corrected. That Marlene, that one item? Yeah. Correct. The one item? Yeah. Okay. Marlene, Marlene, can you explain? It's my understanding, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding that the PO list, that was something that we generated a couple of three years ago as an ongoing list, but we only show what we, sh well, we show it from year to year. So it's a year's worth of a list, and then we start all over again. That is correct. It shows that fiscal year's activity for that PO as a matter of um, course that the process is a PO is a fiscal year PO. So we would regenerate POs every fiscal year, even if the um, contract is multi-year. And so we try and track that. So, but there is a lot of data input. And again, for a contract, the contract is the governing document. The PO allows us to affect payment on that contract. The PO is a mechanism for allowing for payment. Very, yes, very well said, thank you. Okay. All right, Trustee Untuck, do you have any additional questions on that? Uh, one last question, whose responsibility is it to review this document before it's placed on the board agenda each month? I review it with the VP staff 
in a board prep session. And we went through the POs last time that we had our board prep meeting. And we actually talked about the Atkinson one because one of the questions I had is why is it showing there twice? And I guess last question, what was the follow-up from the Erickson from last month when we pulled it and didn't adopt it? Is that what's put on here this month? You know, I'm not, I'm not clear trustee into what that was about. I know there were questions about a number of contracts. So the information I tried to provide you and the trustees was what I knew about all of their contracts. Well, I, I only said that because the last month we, we pulled it and didn't adopt it because uh, we were trying to disallowed understand it? what what yeah was we we're trying to understand why it was so big. If I may, the item that was pulled last month was the PO listing. It, um, yeah. The contract for Erickson had been in place um, with the last amendment was from July of last year. So the pooling of the PO, that specific portion, again, was just the mechanism for payment. The PO listing doesn't affect the contracts. Those are approved either as ratifications or as approvals by the board. And the PO listing reflects the, um, again, the mechanism to make payment on that contract. Um, and that yeah. pooling that I, item I am, causes- I understand, what the, I understand what the purchase order is. But the board action last month was not to pay the purchase order for Liao and for Erickson. If the PO isn't approved, it doesn't get paid. Did you Correct. pay the PO from last month, even though the board didn't authorize it? Pay who? Liao and? Um, Erickson. So remember last month, Erickson was $800,000. We're asking, how did it become $800,000? We pulled it from the agenda. You were, we're going to get information. I am unclear. We actually got the information. And if we are, if the payments were still made from last month, contrary to the board vote. No PO was paid last month for Erickson. Um. <laughs> uh. I see Jackie has her hand up. Oh, uh, Trustee Intuk, if you recall, um, the amount was a variance of $300,000. Remember, um, Superintendent President Bynum, there was a difference of $300,000 that we couldn't come up on when we were looking for the POs and the contract and so forth. Right. That's why I said I'd gotten 500 and that's... There was an error in, the, in that consecutive report of the balances and the expenses and that was corrected. And that's, I believe, why it's lower now. Is that correct? Yes. But I'm not, I guess I'm not understanding pulling it. Um, uh, Trustee Intuck, actually um, the item, the purchasing list is, has to do with approving the current month's purchase orders, total dollar amount. Correct, Marlene? Just the current month for that listing. If you'll see in the body of the uh, agenda item, it states that what you, that you're approving um, was $2,750,273. That's the current purchase order from March 28th through May 1st. So those are new purchase orders. Those are reflected those months. So that had nothing to do with the total dollar amount you see at the bottom of the purchasing um, list, which has to do with ongoing and still open POs and contracts. Is that correct, Marlene? Is that? If I may, the PO list is a ratification item. So when the Board of Trustees approves that item, you are ratifying the previous month's activities. However, based on the concerns issued, we did not pay any POs related to Erickson and did correct the error that was discovered. Yes, good way, good term. <laughs> so so again, again, to clarify, what we didn't pay last month is now on this month's purchase order for payment. Um, not, uh, not exactly. Um, the list last month that was presented to you for ratification had already occurred. All payments reflected on this PO list have already occurred. 
So um, what we did do based on your action of pulling those items, although since that had already happened, it did cause us to make sure that the PO listing was corrected and that we reviewed carefully those payments that would have occurred over this past month for Erickson. So the result was we found the discrepancy. It wasn't 800,000, it was 500,000 and it was reduced by 300,000. Correct. Okay. And then that now is updated in the budget for legal services at 300,000 lower. The budget never reflected that same error. That error was reflected only in the listing of the PO. So that PO listing was the only place that that error occurred. The contracted amounts were correct and the budget associated with the contract was correct that the error was limited to um, its reflection in the PO listing. Okay, that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Trustee Untuck and everyone else who responded. Uh, I need a motion to move on item 6.13. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we've got a motion by Trustee Zia, second by Trustee Baxter to approve item 6.13, the purchase order ratifications. Any discussion? Roll call vote, please, Madam Secretary. Student Trustee Jimenez? Aye. Anya Baxter? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduwak Joe Intuck? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. And Sunny Zia. Aye. Motion carries. And moving on to section seven on the agenda, which is human resources, personnel commission. And I see that Kristen Olson has been standing by. Uh, not sure if you'd be the one to start us off or if it would be uh, Vice, President. Vice President Duran. Yes. Sure. So um, on this particular item, I uh, will ask our executive director of classified, Jennifer Ramos, uh, oh. to present uh, the piece. I saw Jennifer too. Yes. And Ms. Ramos, please. Good evening, President Malalu, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent President Bynum. Thank you for your uplifting video message to classified employees last week. We really appreciate that. My name is Jennifer Ramos, and I've had the pleasure of serving as the Interim Executive Director of Classified Human Resources since late January. So I'm going on four months of serving the district, and it's been a pleasure. So today I'm going to cover the proposed Personnel Commission budget with you. I have four quick slides, and I'll go ahead and dive right in. So the Personnel Commission serves four VP areas, 25 departments, and 410 job classifications that we manage and we work with approximately 540 classified employees. So we're really working with the entire district. We work with the employee groups represented by AFT, but also confidential employees, managers and supervisors, as well as classified administrators. And we're really performing all HR functions on the classified side, and that is our effort to recruit, retain, and help develop talent within our school district. Next slide, please. So the proposed budget, just responding to some of the feedback that we received last year, uh, we wanted to simplify the process. So rather than do a three-year side-by-side -side comparison, which really wasn't comparing apples to apples, we elected to do a two-year side-by-side -side comparison. So we're gonna propose what we, our budget was this year and what we're proposing for the next fiscal year. We're gonna cover five major expenditure groups with, which deals with salaries, benefits, supplies, expenses, and equipment. So what we're proposing is a $638,658 budget. We will use these elements to complete the LACO form, which does require the three-year side-by-side comparison. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna walk you through some of the details here. Um, as I mentioned, we're gonna do a 2019-20 adopted budget comparison with what we're asking for next year. And we'll start with salaries, classified salaries. The first line item is commission members. We're asking for $4,400, the same that we was adopted in last year's budget. And this is to cover all the PC meetings. 
this we have three personnel commissioners and there are two meetings per month the next line item is for executive director you'll notice that from 2019 to 20 to next year there is a decrease of just under eighteen thousand dollars and this amount reflects the previous executive director salary which was slightly higher um, also factoring in the new executive director um, since july of 2019 th that salary difference and a temporary working out of class amount from January of through March of this year for myself. The next line item deals with all of the HR staff from HR manager to the confidential employees, um, LTE assignments that we have and other would be student aides when we elect to, to have student aides work in our office. So you'll notice that there's an increase in that amount and that amount is increasing because we've been able to fill positions permanently, whereas in the past they've been filled on a temporary basis. With that, employee benefits is also going up by close to $7,000. And that just that amount reflects annually due to CalPERS and insurance rate changes, that amount fluctuates um, compounded labor costs. In talking to Sam Chow earlier today, we had projected out a 60, it's typically 63%. We were projecting out an increase to, I'm sorry, 53%. We were projecting out 56%, but I learned today that the benefits amount is 54% on top of an annual salary. The next line item is supplies. We want to have that budget roll over, um, that amount remain consistent. Same with operating expenses and the same with equipment. And so under supplies, a 4,000 line item, and that reflects duplicating costs, supplies, materials, hospitality, if we have catered events, um, and software costs. Software costs would include, for example, we purchase a NeoGov suite for our recruitments, for our perform, performance um, evaluations, and also for onboarding to be able to do those um, functions online. So that would be an example of that. For operating expenses, it includes professional services, mileage, conferences, memberships, legal services, and also software licensing costs. So um, as an example, um, we didn't get to expend the full amount in that category due to COVID, but we typically allot about $5,000 for conferences and about $1,000 for mileage. So those are some examples of costs that fall under that category. So with that said, we are requesting a $640 increase from last year's budget to this year, and where there's no appropriation for contingencies. Next slide, please. So this is just a high level overview of some of the points that I made. It's a $640 increase. That is a decrease in the administrator salary, an increase to the confidential employee salaries, and then for benefits factoring in, we were estimating a 3% bump there, but it is actually a 1% bump. And th that will cover the salaries and benefits and operating costs for the personnel commission staff listed here. There are five staff members, PC members. The operational budget will remain the same. And then we will use these numbers to complete the LACO form, form 504035. And with that, I can answer any questions that you may have. Let's see. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I appreciate that. Um, I just have one quick question. The money that is that was allocated for travel that wasn't used due to COVID, does that get rolled over into next year? Yes, yeah, so right now we're underrunning approximately $85,000 and that would roll over into the general fund if we don't expend it. Thank you. Any additional questions from anyone? President Malibu? Yes, Trustee Antec, sorry, I, I couldn't see you. No worries. Hey, uh, Jennifer, thank you for the presentation. Uh, appreciate the updated format of the budget. Had a question for you. I, I work for the state, and they've asked us to make um, or identify about 15% cuts due to the budget constraint. If you had to make cuts or maybe even mid year cuts, what would you cut from this budget? 
Ooh, I don't know if I can speak to that without talking to my boss, Mr. <laughs> Durand, but. <laughs> I, 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 I appreciate that, and it's an excellent question. Um, one of the things when I came into this role is I'm very conscious of the budgets. And as you can see in particular, there is one vacant position that has remained vacant, which is the HR technician position. Um, so, you, you know, you, you ask a challenging question. Obviously, uh, the district is looking at those um, sort of non-salary uh, costs. So be it travel, um, be it hospitality. Those are things we can look at to cut. Um, other than that, the HR budget does not have a ton of extra float in it at all. Uh, but certainly, if we were asked to make a cut, we would look at everything very, very closely. Thank you. Is there any, are there any other, any additional questions? Okay, Jennifer, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and your very thorough presentation on behalf of the Personnel Commission. And we will move on to section eight on the agenda, which is HR. Section 8.1 is Equal Employment Opportunity Fund Multiple Method Allocation Certification Fiscal Year 2019-2020. And I will defer this to Vice President Duran. It is an action item. Sure. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. So I will be asking our Associate Vice President of Human Resources, Kristen Olson, to uh, quickly go through and uh, talk about this item. Thank you. Kristen, all yours, you're on mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was having trouble with the knob, sorry about that. Good evening, board members, uh, super, superintendent, vice, uh, superintendent president and vice presidents in public. Um, tonight, I wanna to briefly go over the multiple measures report. It is a compliance report under Title V and it uh, audits and keeps track of our diversity related initiatives. Um, there are nine uh, measures within this report that are measured every year. It's an annual report. Um, the first measure has to do with um, an advisory EEO committee, which we do have. Uh, we have the faculty and staff diversity committee. There's other, uh, there's eight additional measures that we need to meet six uh, out of the eight and we do consistently every single year. Um, each year, once we turn in the report, we do receive uh, the maximum funding, which is approximately $40,000 $40, every year. And that money is expended toward uh, diversity initiatives and um, programs. For example, this past year, we had several, um, professional development trainings related to diversity. Um, we had uh, implicit bias um, training. We also had training uh, relating to um, bias uh, language and hate speech. Um, this happened before uh, COVID. Um, we had additional professional developments uh, lined up for the spring. However, COVID-19 happened and we have to defer some of those until next year. Um, in addition to that, we have several diversity initiatives related to recruitment. For example, we participated in a job fair um, within Region 8 this past year. I was actually one of the presenters and we, um, at that particular job fair, we made uh, several good connections and brought some individuals in on the adjunct uh, professor side because of that participation in that job fair. We also participate in um, Improve Your Marketability, which is funded through this program as well. Um, and that is outreach to the community and, and applicant training so individuals will be successful in that process in addition to that. We also have um, a Grow Your Own program, the Faculty Internship Program, which we've successfully run for years now. We have approximately 10 or so interns that participate each year. This is a, a very brief summary of this report. Um, suffice it to say, we have met the measures that we need to, as we do every year. After board approval, the next step is we turn it into the chancellor's office. And then within a few months, the money um, is funded to the college. And that concludes my report. And so board, board President Malauulu, so uh, I have just been reminded that on the previous 7.1, uh, we needed a motion and a second for the board to concur 
uh, with the budget as presented. Sorry, Kristen. No problem. And in addition on this, this item will need action to uh, certify um, the multiple measures report. Thank you. You're right. Thank you, Jean. I'm sorry. That was definitely an oversight. Uh, Section 7.1 is a concurrent roll call vote. So if you don't mind, let's go back to that one so we could wrap that one up. Um, I need a motion and a second to concur with that. If I may, this is item 7.1, the Personnel Commission annual budget. I'll make the motion. Okay. I saw, I believe it was Trustee Baxter and Trustee Zia. Is that correct? Okay, Trustee Baxter made a motion, Trustee Zia uh, with the second. I'm, I'm not sure if that was our student trustee's voice or not. No, that was me, <laughs> the sunny. Uh, okay, trustee. got it. Okay, any discussion on that? Okay, um, Madam Secretary, if you can please call a roll call vote, please. How about Superintendent President Bynum? <laughs> Excuse me, oh, there I have the wrong mouse to unmute myself. I'm running two computers. Okay, Virginia Baxter? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uruak Joe Entuk? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. And student trustee Jimenez, you might not uh, cast a vote on this since it is personnel and salaries and compensation and so forth. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, but may I ask, uh, Ms. Ramos, I didn't see the form attached to the board item for signature for the board. Is there one or is this a new? So, Jack, Jackie, it is in there. Okay, I didn't see, I, I looked at that form, but I didn't see the signature part. Okay, I'll check it out. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Motion carries. And then going back to item 8.1, uh, we also need a motion in a second. First of all, thank you to Kristen Olson. And then I apologize too, I'm seeing flashbacks of when you were uh, over the uh, Personnel Commission and you would report to us the annual budget. So I apologize for that. Um, no. you, know, you know how when you're pregnant, it's pregnancy brain. Well, now everybody's saying COVID brain. <laughs> you know, I've got, I've got COVID brain big time these days. Okay, so I will entertain a motion and a second. Trustee Baxter with a motion. I need a second, second please. Check. Trustee Otto with a second. Let me read what we're voting on. This is that the Board of Trustees approve and certify the Equal Employment Fund Multiple Method Allocation Certification Form, fiscal year 2019-2020 as submitted. Any discussion on this? Madam Secretary, if you could please take roll. Student Trustee Jimenez? Aye. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduwakjo Intuk? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. And Sunny Zia? Aye. Okay, motion carries. We will move on to section nine, which is academic senate, and there is nothing underneath academic senate. Am I correct on that? My yes, students, yes, yes, you are. All right, thank you. And section 10, Vice President Scott, nothing under academic affairs, is that correct? Correct, thank you. So we, we must be either getting to the end of the school year or everybody's just tapped out, COVID tapped out. All right, moving on to section 11 on the agenda, administrative and business services. This is Vice President Drinkwine. And this is the, you know, everybody's probably been waiting on the governor's May revised budget. So this is an update for us. Thank you. And I will try and make this brief. Um, I will first say that um, we have been analyzing very quickly um, the May revision. And so I want to thank my team, John Thompson and Sam Chow primarily for their incredible work. Um, I think we've all seen this quote a few times with Governor Newsom's release on May 14th he started his um, document with the statement that this is no normal year and this is no ordinary May revision. Um, so I'll remind you that with the delay of the income tax um, from April 15th to July 15th, this May revision is more preliminary than what it is typical for a May revision. And it won't be until um, after July 15th that the state will actually know what their revenues are. So. Um, we may be facing 
a very late budget revision by the state sometime in August, and it won't be until that point that we actually know where we are with our revisions. Next slide, please. Um, the governor did identify the total impact on the state budget as being a $60 billion swing. He had been anticipating nearly a $6 billion surplus in January 2020, just a few short months ago, and now he projects a $54 billion deficit. Um, he has, along with other governors, requested additional federal aid of a trillion dollars for all 50 states. And he has stated that some of the proposed cuts would be offset by any receipt of new federal aid. Um, it is uncertain whether another federal aid bill would be successful. I think we're all watching the news. Um, and in what amount and in what portion would go to states to backfill lost revenue, but he has committed in using any of those types of funds to help offset some of these cuts. Next slide, please. So specifically for community colleges, his primary proposal is to reduce student-centered funding formulas by 10%. Now this is after the application of the 2.1% COLA. So this is an effective cut of 8%. So if you took our revenue from 2019-20 and reduced it by 8%, about $12.5 million is our cut. That cut applies to all districts. Hold harmless, basic aids, all districts would get that cut. So that's the primary cut in our unrestricted general fund. Um, there are several additional cuts to categorical programs. One of the most impactful is to the strong workforce funding. It's being reduced by about 50%. This is about $1.2 million cut for LBCC. For our student equity and achievement program, that cut is about 14%, about a million dollars. Additional categorical reductions we're still evaluating. Um, it is problematic because we've already prepared those budgets for the tentative budget. Um, but basically no program will receive a COLA. Any program that was uh, proposed to get expanded funding or new funding in January, that funding is eliminated. In addition, we're seeing a statewide reduction of almost $67 million for adult education, which will impact our operations. We are seeing apprenticeship programs being reduced. We are seeing reductions to food pantries, and we are also seeing reductions for Dreamer resource liaisons. Next slide, please. There are some programs that Governor Newsom has committed to sustaining, and this is with a zero COLA. Again, that's important because we have natural increases in expenditures such as step and column. But those programs he has committed to sustaining is the two years free college promise, EOPS, DSPS, and immigrant legal services. Next slide, please. There are additional fiscal impacts. So he has taken some actions to try and offset a very small portion of those cuts. Um, but first he proposes to defer apportionment payments. And those of you who remember the great recession this is a maneuver by the state that they're able to shift an expenditure from one fiscal year to another. We still get the same overall revenue, but we get paid late. It's almost as if your employer has a cash flow problem and says, I'm gonna pay you next month for this month's payroll. And then in fact, that's what's happening for us. We do have sufficient reserves to cover the first deferral from 1920 to 2021. Unfortunately, when we do our cash flow projections looking out over the course of a year with all those cuts, we do not believe we'll have sufficient cash to sustain us for the second deferral and would have to borrow cash. Um, that's typically done through the issuance of a tax revenue and anticipation note, which means that we would have to bear the costs of financing to borrow cash for those summer months. Now, the good news is that the state is redirecting their contributions to balance the stores and purse funds to benefit us. They're saying for the two year period of 18, excuse me, 2021 and 21 22, 
that those contributions will count towards our district employer contributions, reducing our employer rates. We anticipate savings of about $2 million from that redirection. Next slide, please. Um, he does propose some policy changes to help support our ability to manage these cuts. The first is he proposes an extension in the hold harmless for an additional two years through 2023, 24. But again, we are subject to the cuts. So this extension is at that reduced level. He also proposes to exempt COVID-19 related expenses from the 50% law. This means that we would be less likely to violate that 50% law due to an increase in expenditures from COVID. He also um, continues the uh, proposal to suspend procedures regarding the development of short-term CTE courses and programs. And interestingly, although he proposes to eliminate and reduce funding for food pantries and dreamer resource liaisons, he's proposing that we utilize our existing seat funding for those purposes. But again, remember, he's going to cut seat funding by 14%. So it's an interesting proposal to use less money for more purposes. So next slide, please. The impact to our budget is severe. So barring, and again, I do want to preface this, these are preliminary numbers, but we did want to share these numbers as quickly as we could. And barring any um, activities to reduce expenditures, you can see that our impact would be an inability of us to fully fund the goals institutional effectiveness reserve um, for 2020-21 that um, rather than having about the $16 million requirement meant we will be short about 10.9 million, we will have zero unassigned reserves. So it is quite a swing from our previous projections. Um, and I will address the um, FEMA and the CARES Act um, elephant in the room that both of those sources of funding would be for new expenditures. So FEMA, we would not receive probably for a three-year period. We expect it to be less than 100% of um, funding, and it would be reflective of our increased expenditures and in our managing this crisis. Uh, we understand that things that would be eligible would include our differential for on-site classified employees, um, increases in expenditures for personal protective equipment, cleaning supplies, that type of thing. The CARES Act, um, while the legislation initially stated it could be used to restore lost revenues under the Department of Ed's guidance, it may not be used for lost revenues. Instead, it is to support new expenses related to preserving instruction. And so that means we can use it for uh, technology. We can use it for laptops and Chromebooks. We can use it for training stipends. We can use it for additional overtime, additional staff hours, additional supplies, purposes, purchases. We cannot use it for baseline salaries and we cannot use it for lost revenues. Next slide, please. So we have a long list of next steps. So we are continuing our evaluation of the May revision with the understanding that this is just another proposal and it does go to the legislature for their consideration. We are refining our enrollment projections. As you can imagine, it is an unprecedented year and the dynamics of its impact on our enrollment are several. We expect we might have increased enrollment from some areas, from students who may be unemployed and seeking job training, from um, recently uh, high school graduates who are foregoing attendance um, at university um, and instead attending ours, if it's going to be online, they may choose us instead. But we also anticipate a drop in enrollment from students who um, do struggle with an online environment. We are identity, identifying those opportunities and options for expenditure reductions. We want to develop a very robust plan of options for the board's consideration for how we can manage this extreme reduction in funding. 
we will pre be presenting to you in June our tentative budget. The tentative budget will be more tentative than typical. We do have to have a budget passed by July 1 to have expenditure authority. However, we do understand that the state won't finalize their budget process until late in the summer. And so this is indeed a tentative budget. Um, we do anticipate needing to respond to what the state does enact in June, regardless of its preliminary nature, and we'll be presenting to the board in September our final budget, understanding that we will have further, further revisions, however, in response to what the state's actions are later in the year. So this is a very dynamic and uh, fluid situation, and it is our intent to keep the board and the community fully informed as we go forward and to identify a plan that will maintain the district's solvency. Next slide, please. And with that is my brief presentation of the May revise, and I welcome your questions. Okay, got it. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Vice President Drinkwine? I just have a comment. <coughs> yes, comment is, Trustee Otto. Yeah, my comment is yuck. Um, um, I, I, I don't expect this to get better. In fact, I don't expect, I mean, the, the idea that we would get a fair share of a trillion dollars out of the federal government I think is fanciful um, and uh, we may get some offset but uh, these are a couple of really hard years coming up that's all thank you anybody else um, I, have, uh, I have one question was that you trustee Untuck? sorry I, I can't I, see the entire uh, gallery because of the screen. So I can't see if anybody is is trying to speak or not. I, I had a question, but I have a uh, um, junior trustee here with me. Got it. Okay. All right. Go ahead with your question, trustee. Can I ask uh, about uh, more explanation on the reserve for BPRS? I, I think those are business processes. Was that money that was saved from past business processes or that's money that's going to be used for business process improvements? Can on slide eight under reserves for BPRS, can there be some additional explanation on that? Certainly. Um, we received one-time funding for mandated block grants several years ago. And at that time, in recognition of the one-time nature of those funds, the board determined that they wanted to set aside those funds to support business process reviews. And so um, what you see on that slide, and it, Daria, if we could reverse back to the slide there, uh, thank you very much. Um, what you're seeing here under assigned reserves, um, and you see that the February projection was 2 million eight, the current preliminary May revision is 2 million three. Um, that reflects the balance of those one-time funds and the um, board's designation of those amounts to be used for business process reviews. The reason you see us increase of 300,000 is that we now have refined our projections for the current year, for the 2019-20 year, and expect to have a greater carryover balance from that going into next year. Great, thanks. Also, can you talk to the CARES Act and how that money can be spent or how much general funds does that make available? Can any of that be used for kind of uh, transition from in-person to online classes? Yes, thank you. So we've received a total of just over $14 million in CARES Act funding. Half of that is um, processed through our financial aid um, fund in support of direct cash aid to students. And Dr. Munoz um, and his team lead that effort and um, set up the requirements for students to access that aid. Um, the CARES Act does require that that be for students who have suffered and need financial aid as a direct um, impact of COVID-19. The other half, is the institution portion. 
And that half must be used to continue to support instruction during COVID-19, but it may not be used to pay existing salaries. So what does that mean? It means we can use it to get new software and new systems to support online instruction. As you can imagine, the IT support has been challenging with remote working and remote instruction. It can be used for additional technology, laptops, Chromebooks. It can be used for the differential to have classified staff on site. It can be used for training stipends. It can be used if we have additional staff costs for supporting on-site essential labs um, and any increase in costs resulting from that. Unfortunately, it cannot supplant and pay for current existing costs. So it can be used to um, pay for those new costs associated with COVID-19. We do have to spend it within one year of receipt. We accepted those funds in late March. And so we have until March, 2021 to fully expend those. So we can continue to meet the needs and the expenses of online instruction and remote working through the course of 2020. Thanks, a follow-up question. I saw a couple of other districts have taken their CARES money and not done salaries, but did like one-time bonuses or payouts to help with the transition. What, what would that look like at Long Beach City College? Those um, amounts paid need to be directly related to instruction. And so rather than, although it might be communicated as a bonus, it has to have a direct nexus to what we are doing to support that online instruction. So whether it's because of its training or if it's paying for additional services that um, faculty have gone through to um, create these online programs, it has to um, be have strong enough documentation that shows it's connected to the furtherance of that instruction provision. Um, we fully expect these expenditures to be audited. They have to comply with federal auditing standards. And so it's important that however we spend them, we are able to document that they are for the support of that instruction. Thanks, one other question on the, um, I think still slide eight. The, you have, you have a projected in, end balance, uh, 25 million, is that correct? for February 2020 as a second, um, so second the way, line there? The, the top it, line on this slide reflects our deficit spending. The second slide, or the second line rather, reflects our projected ending fund balance. Um, but it's not enough just to say this is our ending fund balance. We need to show what are the components of those ending fund balance. And in this case, just due to regular deficit spending, we would have been short. We need to meet our 5.5% economic uncertainties reserve. That is what's required by the chancellor's office to show fiscal solvency. The board has adopted an additional goal of 9.5% for institutional effectiveness. Um, we discussed the assigned reserve for BPRs. And then the last assignment is for the vacation and load banking obligation. So obviously, as people earn vacation, we owe it, and that's a reflection of that. Um, that is the debt that we owe our employees. In red, you'll see the shortfall in IE reserve. That indicates that we are, for the February projection, $1.6 million short of meeting that 9.5% uh, board goal um, for institutional effectiveness. And then after we apply the reductions from the May revision, we then are $10.9 million short of meeting the board's goal for that reserve. And, and just to clarify, on your previous budget slides, you had shown there was $33 million in the reserves, and that would be the $25 million plus that $7.6 million deficit? That is absolutely correct. The $33 million reserve is the projected ending fund balance for 2019-20. Um, it has a little bit more than $6 million in unassigned reserves, meaning we can think of that as our um, 
soft landing. It's um, allowed the 2020-21 year to meet almost all of its reserve requirements. Um, the deficit spending was in large part due to a much smaller COLA than what it had initially been presented as, long, as well as a fawn penalty. Um, we have reversed that fawn penalty in this May revision projection. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Sorry, I'm on mute. Yes, Trustee Baxter. Um, uh, Marlene, what is the definition of institutional effectiveness? The institutional effectiveness goal, as my understanding, was that the chancellor's office had a recommendation that in order to maintain operations, that a district should have additional reserves that allows it to react in times such as those we're facing right now. And so the board adopted that recommendation with an additional nine and a half percent reserve. Okay, so it is a goal. Yeah, it is it, it, typically it, for a specific program. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, I have a question um, regarding, so on this presentation that you just made, where is the reserve on this presentation? I know in February we talked about the 33 million, I believe. Um, it wasn't mentioned in this budget impact, in, the, in this presentation here. Correct. I did not specifically address 2019-20. We actually have in the next agenda item an update on, for the third quarter of 2019-20. I wanted to focus this presentation on the 2020-21 May revision proposal. Um, and um, But when you, we do get to that item, you'll see that we project 2019-20 to end with the fund balance of $33 million. Um, that would fully meet the board mandated reserves as well as the assigned reserves. Okay, got it. Now, um, so I have, I have two questions. One, going back to the CARES Act and then the other one jumping back to the reserves. So when you said that the CARES Act um, doesn't specifically allow for payroll new um, new type of uh, faculty uh, salaries, but it has to be continuing or COVID related or supplies. Is that because, you know, are there, I haven't read the entire CARES Act, but is that because we're an academic institution? Because we applied for some funding through my job and we were able to use our CARES Act money that um, we were granted in fact, I think we got an additional grant that we were able to use for payroll. Is, is there a difference in you know agencies that are applying for it and how they're able to use the money? Yes, thank you, there is a difference. Um, a portion of the CARE Act provided funds um, for the payroll protection loans. Um, and as a matter of fact, Pat and I and our Small Business Development Center have been instrumental in making those funds available to our community. Those may be used for existing payroll. The CARES Act funds that are available to higher education were first defined in the CARES Act itself, but then further restricted by the Department of Education. The Department of Education really restricted it far beyond what the original legislation stated. Um, and so for us, it eliminated the possibility of using it for lost revenues. Um, so uh, we have a lot of student fees that we're refunding, think parking fees, material fees, that type of things that um, we cannot, although we anticipated using the CARES Act fund to backfill, we cannot use it for that purpose. And it also explicitly stated that we could use these funds only for those activities that support education under COVID-19. So that means that we can't use them to pay our regular base level salaries. It's not going to give us relief and we can't just use the $7 million to cover salaries. 
But what we can certainly do is identify those extra new expenses, like a training stipend, that we can certainly use these funds to support that. We just have to make sure that we document very well how we did indeed use them for that purpose. Got it. So other districts have given their faculty bonuses through the CARES Act. So I'm, I'm aware of other faculty members who have received bonuses. So considering that our faculty basically had to transition, you know, was it 1,200 classes, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, to remote learning and online access in one weekend, you know, the CARES Act would fund a bonus to compensate the faculty for having to work throughout the weekend and having to learn technology. We had uh, two presenters during uh, comments earlier today who shared their experiences with us. So that would come from the CARES Act and that wouldn't have an impact on our district budget, correct? Right, if we could determine that that's an appropriate use of the funds, then yes, use for that purpose should be allowable. Um, again, I wouldn't term it a bonus, um, but if it is um, in response to paying uh, faculty for additional hours, we can certainly investigate that and make sure. Part of our challenge is that we know we will definitely be audited on our use of these funds. Um, and since it's a brand new program, we don't have a history of what that audit looks like or what those allowable uses are. And so really it's about making our best um, guess on what and how to interpret this language. Okay, but earlier you said that we could, Ali, we could use the CARES Act money for bonuses. That, I mean, yeah. that, that was your language. And I know that other districts have done that, but the bonuses that I'm referring to would be in terms of compensating our faculty for, and, and, you know, everybody in general, all of our employees for the work that they've done. Um, also, what about, uh, if I remember correctly, and I think I referenced this earlier with the chancellor's um, letter that I'd mentioned earlier, there was a $7 million reprieve or some discretionary fund. Is that money that we could also use for stipends or bonuses or to compensate for the unusual circumstances or the unusual working conditions that faculty and staff have had to endure? Um, I know that faculty members um, have had to make changes in their homes and purchase equipment and uh, just basically allocate living space that you know they may or may not have because of their families, children home from school. So would that come out of that $7 million discretionary fund or would that come from the CARES Act? The um, CARES Act institution portion is the $7 million and it can be used to purchase supplies for remote instruction. So in addition to providing a laptop, it can be used, um, for instance, if a uh, faculty needed to purchase a tripod to support their cell phone to film a lesson. So it may be used for those types of expenditures as well. Okay, got it. And then um, going back to the reserves question, I think you've answered all my questions with regard to, um, to the CARES Act, but going back to the reserves, so I just, you know, speak to me like I'm a, an English professor and not a math professor, please. So we have 33 million in reserves right now. That's what was projected in February and that's what we have now. And that's what the next agenda item will project that will end the fiscal year with. Right, so that is what we project will end the fiscal year, which means that's what we'll start 2020-21 with. And okay. so if you take that $33 million and you deduct for our February 2020 projection, that's 7.6 million in the first column, you actually end up with the 25.8. Or for the May revision, we um, project having deficit spending of nearly 15 million. So that 33 minus that 15 gives you the $18 million projected any fund balance after the May revision. In my head, and forgive me, but in my head, it, you you make the jump from, and I don't mean you personally, but I mean the, the numbers jump from 33 to 25 to 18, you know, they jump down so quickly, but when it comes time to evaluating the, the bulk of the amount as 33 million as a whole, it just seems to be undermined with a lot of emphasis being put on the losses. And it's hard for me to kind of synthesize that because I know that we've talked about a great recession coming up and I know that we've talked about um, maybe enrollment going up, maybe enrollment going down. But if I remember correctly, you 
you meant, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you mentioned that we would need to dip into, that we we would need to dip into reserves to pay or to, you know, make faculty salaries, but that wasn't done before. Before, I believe that we used trans, you know, the funding was trans to make the money add up. Am, am I, do, do you understand what I'm asking? I do. Um, so your first question first, in red, you see um, under the May revision, I show 10.9 million in red. That's the shortfall. That's how much we're falling short of meeting the board institutional effectiveness goal. Okay. Um, recall that the cut to student-centered funding formula, we estimated being a cut of $12.5 million for us. So we have a reduction of about $12.5 million for 2020-21. And that's okay. why you see such a severe cut. Okay, but that's not my question. Um, so my question is that the, the district never really used reserves. I, mean, I remember that we used trans, like all the other districts, they use trans money. So, but you're proposing using the reserves rather than trans to make payroll. And that's the part I don't understand. Why are things gonna be different this time, especially when COVID actually presents discretionary funding. So in the past, we never used the reserves, right? We always use trans for payroll. So right now you're proposing using the reserve, but that's never been done before. And other districts also did the same thing with the trans, but now we even have more money. We've got COVID money coming in. So we have an opportunity to offset having to use the reserves, you know, say if we were pushed up against the wall and we had to, you know, we could, stretch COVID money, not into actual payroll, but to help faculty to mitigate their home teaching, online remote learning. Um, so I just don't understand why you're proposing using the reserves now when they've never been used before. And I, I know, I get it. I understand your position as far as, you know, being conservative to protect the district. I get that, but it's never been used before. Now we have extra money coming in. I just wanna be able to understand that. Sure, um, it has been used before. Um, so let me back up just a second. There's a difference between cash and fund balance. Your cash is the cash we have in the bank. And so you use that trans to borrow cash because the, since the state's delaying the payment of um, a month's of revenue to us, we're gonna be short cash in that month to make payroll. So we have to borrow cash through a trans to get the cash to pay the payroll. But the state eventually pays us back. So they still owe us that revenue. And so our fund balance is when we take a year's worth of revenue, less a year's worth of expenditure, that's our fund balance versus that cash balance in summer that's gonna be low because the state's delayed that month's payment. So necessarily any time you have deficit spending, you do spend your reserves. And so um, I would love to come back to you with a greater analysis of what your budget reflected during the last great recession, but you cannot borrow out of a negative ending fund balance. You can borrow out of negative cash, but borrowing doesn't improve your ending fund balance. Well, is, it. Isn't it also correct that when we do a trans, we um, end up owing an interest rate on that money? Yes, it actually costs us money. So um, think of it as when you borrow money, you now owe the debt. They balance each other out. The benefit in the cash is balanced out by the debt, and the cost of issuing that debt is even greater. Okay, got it. Okay, well... Um, I, I appreciate that, and especially uh, because numbers are not my strength, so I, I need it to be as simplified as possible. And you know, I'm I'm pretty sure that anybody tuning in or watching um, who has an interest in this might appreciate the explanation you just gave. My my brain here is 33 million dollars in reserve, and and the fact that we have been able to be creative and resourceful in terms of uh, our faculty and, and being able to make the um, good faith effort to compensate faculty for all the hard work 
Um, I, I, I think Trustee Baxter and I are, are the only two who've actually taught in LBCC classrooms. I know Trustee Untuck has taught at Cal State Long Beach, but it's very difficult for us on the front line as faculty members to see budgets that show consistent high number of reserves year after year, and then to constantly be told that there's not enough money to pay our salary, there's not enough money for increases. And uh, situations like this, it's really hard for me because I know my responsibility as a board member is to represent the district. I get that, I know that I was elected, I have a fiduciary responsibility to the district, but I can't forget where I come from. And I can't forget the experiences that I've had in a classroom on the front line with students and how important it is for, and, and I agree, it's been said before and I said it for years and years too, that faculty working conditions are certainly reflective of student learning conditions. And it's just frustrating to me to have a budget that as a board member I have to approve that has $33 million in reserves and yet we nickel and dime our employees, not just faculty, but our classified staff as well, our hourly instructors as well. And it's a difficult balance to protect the district, but at the same time, respect the integrity of the work that our employees perform. And then you have this gigantic situation like COVID happening where we're asking employees to do crazy, unprecedented things that our children's children will be reading about years from now. And I, you know, we heard two stories today, but there's going to be hundreds and thousands of stories like that about what educators have had to endure. So all of that sacrifice and all of that struggle and hardship against $33 million reserve. Earlier, we talked about optics. So the optics here in my mind at least, just don't make sense because I've been in a classroom and I know what that's like and I know how difficult it is and I can't imagine what it's like right now with COVID, I just can't. I mean, it, it's hard for me to do my job at home with four kids, but I'm not in front of a cell phone or a laptop teaching a lecture or running a lab or, you know, I see my son who is a welding student at LBCC having to sit there and learn to weld through his iPad and having to take quizzes and theory is one thing, but practice is another. And there's an instructor at the other end of that screen. And I hear the questions. I hear these students asking questions and it breaks my heart because that faculty member has to make that student understand a, a principle of welding, a lab. We've got nursing students. We've got language students who need to have uh, you know, I, I, I spoke to somebody who said that they have to do breakout sessions so students can practice language. So all those hardships and struggles, $33 million in reserve, plus extra money from CARES, it's just, you know, we, I think as a district, we can do better and other districts do better and they figure it out. They make it happen. They're able to compensate their faculty and they're able to, to, to do things. Why is it so hard for Long Beach City College to do that? So anyway, that's enough. Um, and, I, and, and Marlene, I respect your job. I know, I know what your job is. I know what your job and your uh, responsibility to the budget of the district is. I get that. So it's not, you know, I'm not disagreeing with you, the person. I'm disagreeing with the information and how it's coming out because I think we can do better. And, and by the same token, I also ask the same of the faculty. You know, I ask, and um, Ms. Bynum and I had a great conversation a couple of days ago, or was it yesterday? I don't know. The days kind of blend in. Was it yesterday or two days ago? But we had a great conversation, and we talked about um, building consensus, consensus, and we talked about working together and hammering out a contract where both sides are happy. Nobody is going to get everything they want. The district, the faculty, it's just, it's just not possible in this world, but we certainly can do better both sides can do better. And that's what I'm asking for, especially with this budget presentation that you're showing. I mean, you know, we've been here before. We always talk about reserves, but this time we've asked our faculty to do so much more that, you know, it's never happened. So anyway, enough of, you know, I'm sorry. I just get very emotional and passionate because I know where I come from. I know where I come from. 
So, okay, anybody else uh, wanna add to this? Any other board members? All right, so this is an information item only. We're gonna move on to item 11.2. Thank you, Vice President Drinkwine, I appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, item 11.2, this is what you were referring to, the third quarter budget performance report. Again, this is an information item. And I haven't said this during this meeting, but for the benefit of the public, if anybody is interested in um, checking out the attached documents on board doc, there are documents there to support the presentations and they are available for public view. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, Marlene. Thank you. Um, so this report reflects um, the progression of the 2019-2020 fiscal year. We started off with the tentative um, budget showing um, projected deficit spending of um, about 2.9 million um, over the course of the adopted budget. Um, and now through where we project to end up the year, we expect to have um, higher expenditures so our deficit spending has increased to $3.2 million um, with an ending fund balance, as we've discussed, of um, nearly $33 million, of which $7.9 million is unassigned. Okay, got it. And I think that's a good segue into 11.3, which is the 2019-2020 CCFS 3-311Q, the third quarterly financial status report. This is an action item. Uh, could, could you speak on that? Certainly, it reflects the same data as in 11.2. This report, however, is required to be submitted to the chancellor's office. Um, it provides them with an update for the third quarter on our progress on our budget. Okay, got it. So I will entertain a second, uh, a motion in a second, but let me read out what we're gonna be voting on, please. This is uh, recommended action, Title V, Section 58310, requires California Community College District to report quarterly on their financial condition. The attached CC FS-311Q satisfies this requirement and reflects the projected revenues and expenditures through June 30th, 2020, as well as actual activity covering July 1st, 2019 through March 31st, 2020 as submitted. I need a, a motion and a second, please. A move. Okay, I, I believe I heard trust, student trustee make the motion and uh, trustee Baxter, was that you with the second? Yeah. I need a trustee to make the motion for the recording. So how about Dr. Baxter, you make the motion? Okay, I'll second it. Make the second. This is, uh, trustee Zia. Trustee Zia with the second. Any discussion on that item? Okay, roll call vote, please. Uh, student trustee Jimenez. Aye. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduwakjo Intuk. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Elizia. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Moving on to item 11.4. That's another action item. It's a resolution assignment of delinquent tax receivable. Uh, the recommended action is that the Board of Trustees adopt resolution number 052720B approving the assignment of delinquent tax receivables to the California Statewide Delinquent Tax fi Finance Authority for the fiscal years ending June 30, 2020 through June 30, 2022, and authorizing execution and delivery of related documents and actions as submitted. Uh, is there a second on this item? Second. I don't have a first. I'm sorry, we have a motion. Trustee Otto with the motion, is there a second? Second. Trustee Baxter with the second. Any discussion on this item? I'm sorry, uh, Vice President Drinkwine, did, did you wanna comment on this? Um, I'm not sure if you recall um, what this resolution is for. It is a renewal for a three year period. Um, essentially, um, there is a firm that buys our outstanding um, property taxes and gives us a 10% premium for it. Um, we make a small amount of revenue, about $11,000 a year. Uh, it's operated through LACO. Okay, got it. Thank you. 
Any discussion on this item? Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Madam Secretary, roll call vote, please. Student Trustee Jimenez. Aye. Bax, uh, Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uwak Joe Entuck. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. Thank Motion you. carries. Moving on to section 12 on the agenda. This is student services. Item 12.1 is an amendment to the annual compensation for student trustee for board policy 2027. This is an action item. Um, we have uh, visited this item before. The recommended action is that the board of trustees amend the board action of April 22nd, 2020 to approve the monthly compensation for the student trustee as $105 per month to one. There's a minor typo there. As $105 per month as submitted. At the meeting of April 22nd, 2020, the Board of Trustees approved to continue the monthly compensation for the student trustee of $100 per month as per the August 28th, 2019 revised board policy 2027 board member compensation. The compensation increased to $105 per month, effective June 1st, 2019. Um, I'll entertain a motion and a second on that. So moved. Second. Trustee Baxter with the motion, Trustee Otto with the second discussion. I have a question. Um, and uh, Madam Secretary, maybe you can answer this. So this clearly says per month. Uh, I have heard, and please tell me if this is a bad rumor, but I've heard that some student trustees are actually compensated a stipend per meeting. Is that accurate? Does the uh, district have you know discretion on that? It is basically the same as the board and it can be calculated, calculated out per meeting. But since you receive your pay per month, we've um, listed it as such. But if you really are, if we schedule two regular meetings and you did not attend one of them, you could be only compensated for 50% of your month that month. Okay, so, and the same applies for student trustees? Our student trustee has no, um, we cannot ex give her, pay her for an excused absence like jury duty or family emergency like we can for a trustee by resolution. Um, they're paid if they're there. If they're not, they're not paid. What about if a student trustee has class? Um, you know, we. Is that, is that considered an excuse? It's not written into that that we can pay them as an excuse absence. Uh, it's just one of the education codes. Um, okay. So I assume that a student trustee maybe takes on trustee, but maybe can get an excuse from the class or come and at least attend a portion and leave. Um, it might, we might run into that matter, but hopefully not. <laughs> okay, and then um, one other question. So if, so you're saying that the $105 um, is for regular meeting, but if there are special meetings and there's no compensation? Um, no, what would happen is we would split the payroll up. If you, let's say you had three or four meetings we would have to prorate it in the payroll system. Like let's say there was three regular meetings, but on those special meetings that um, the trustee, the student trustee was not required to attend, such as the closed session or something, we cannot, um, you know, ding her for that. She's not required to be there, so. Okay, got it. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate that clarification. Okay, so I'll entertain a, we already have a motion in a second there. I believe it was Trust yes. Mr. Trustee Otto. Any additional yes. discussion? Okay, Madam Secretary, roll call vote, please. Uh, Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduwak Joe Entuck. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. And I assume the student will abstain. Yes, abstain. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item 12.2, resolution recognizing Asian Pacific Islander Desi Heritage Month. And this is an action item. The resolution is attached. May is um, considered the Asian Pacific 
Islander um, Desi Heritage Month. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Joshua Castellanos here. We had a lively discussion a couple of weeks ago uh, regarding the word Desi. Um, you know, I, I uh, ignorantly thought it was an abbreviation of designation, and it actually turned out to be uh, a different, um, uh, I guess I should say, sub-ethnic category of Asian Pacific Islander. And, and I feel very sheepish admitting that because my husband is Samoan of Samoan descent. So I learned something new, and Josh and I uh, kind of hammered that out together. So thank you, Josh, if you're listening. Um, I will entertain a second and a motion, uh, a motion and a second on that to approve that resolution. So moved. Second. Second. Trustee Untuck seconded. Okay, Trustee Zia made the motion. Trustee Untuck seconded. Any discussion? All right, uh, roll call vote, please. Student Trustee Jimenez? Aye. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduwakjo Untuck? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm a motion carries. I'm I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Uh, Dr. Munoz, this is in your department. Uh, would you like to just say a few words about that? Sorry, I apologize. I should have done that before we took the vote. Thank you. Um. So, like, uh, thank you for approving the resolution in support of Asian Pacific Islander Desi um, Heritage Month. Um. Tomorrow we have our big event for um kind of close out the month-long celebration and recognition for our APIC community. Um, we have Congresswoman Judy Chu that will be providing a keynote. And so we're just really appreciative to the board and, and the support, as well as to um, the planning committee. Um, Stacey Toda has been very instrumental in providing support, not just for, for this month's celebration, but for all of our Cultural Heritage Month celebration. And we actually um, yesterday sent to print our um, final version of our Asian and Pacific Islander Desi um, student resource guide. So we will be sharing that soon. So that was one of the questions I was planning on asking to see if there would be a resource guide. Um, you did such a yes. beautiful job with the uh, Hispanic heritage and the African American and different other cultures represented on campus. I lament that we have not had any events this month. I was looking forward to a big luau and some hula dancing on campus so we will have to make up for it next year yes definitely thank the you. motion carries and thank you to all of our students of uh, asian pacific um, pacific islander desi backgrounds and for the rich vibrant cultures and um, traditions that you share with our community item 12.3 is another resolution it is regarding jewish american heritage month this is an action item the recommended action is that the Board of Trustees adopt Resolution 052720D, recognizing Jewish American Heritage Month as submitted. I will also defer that to Dr. Munoz if you'd like to weigh in on that. Sure. So in support of and recognition of Jewish Americans, we um, are asking the board to pass a resolution um, recognizing um, Jewish American Heritage Month. And I know that this will be the first time that the college will have done so. And so we're really, um, we are very much proud to be able to um, recognize the diverse student population here at LBCC. And so again, we encourage the board to consider this resolution. Thank you. I will entertain a motion. Second, so move, Trustee Intuk. Second. Okay, we've got a motion by Trustee Untuck, second by student Trustee Jimenez. Is that correct? Uh, no, I will need a second by a trustee to record. So I mean, seconded. By a trustee, I'm sorry, not a student trustee. <laughs> okay, second by Trustee Otto. Uh, Madam Secretary, any discussion on this item? Okay, Madam Secretary, roll call vote, please. Student Trustee Jimenez? Aye. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduak Joe Intuck? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. And Sunny Zia? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, motion carries. And now we're moving on to section 13 on the agenda. These are reports. 13.1 Academic Senate President. 
Let me, my, my screen is being weird and I, I can't see everybody on gallery mode. Um, they can take down the four docs, Dario. Thank there you. it is. Okay, so welcome Jerry Florence. Thank you, good evening. With the onslaught of COVID-19 pandemic this spring, many changes happened quickly on campus. While all were not necessarily popular throughout the college rank and file, our collective focus remained on ensuring the success of our students. Without the open, transparent communication among campus leadership, management, full and part-time faculty, classified staff and students, we would not, could not have made the strides we have made. Everyone was and is and remains committed, focused and dedicated. We have set an example that others up and down the state are trying to emulate. I believe this success is due in part to the close working relationship between the Academic Senate, the Classified Senate, LBCCFA, and AFT. On behalf of the Academic Senate, I would like to recognize the leadership of Dr. Kathy Scott, Executive Vice President of Academic Affairs. She has worked closely with all of us, sought our input, heard our concerns, worked hard to reach consensus, brought much needed laughter to very long meetings and been a teammate extraordinaire. When issues arrive on, arise on campus, I am often asked, what is the Senate's position on that matter? This might seem like an easy, straightforward question to some, but as a democratic organization committed to reflecting the will of the whole rather than an individual or a small group, the Academic Senate relies on a formal resolutions process in which positions are drafted, debated, and ultimately voted on by the entire organization. At Long Beach City College, this is something that the Senate has always taken very seriously. Resolution writing is not entered into lightly. Thus, when undertaken, it is a strong statement to the college community as a whole that the resolution represents the official stand of the Academic Senate on a particular matter. The last time the Senate brought forth and passed a resolution and then shared it with the Board of Trustees was over four years ago. At the May 22nd meeting, the Academic Senate unanimously passed Resolution 55.1, support for the temporary use of primarily online instruction during the fall semester of 2020. It reads, whereas faculty and staff of the Long Beach Community College District in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, shifted rapidly to temporarily remote instruction. Whereas the Long Beach City College District is concerned for the health and safety of its students, its employees and members of the surrounding communities. Whereas the Long Beach City College Community College District has demonstrated a commitment to transparent shared governance process and a collaborative approach when facing impacts and challenges to health and safety on campus. Resolved, the Academic Senate and the Committee on Curriculum and Instruction will conduct all meetings via Zoom during the fall 2020 semester. Resolved, the Academic Senate is committed to ongoing faculty professional development and training for successful distance education. Resolved, the Academic Senate supports the district's decision to temporarily use primarily online instruction for fall semester 2020 with limited exceptions for labs and other hard to convert courses. I simply must acknowledge the amazing faculty leaders that has served as members of the Academic Senate Executive Board. They are the greatest teammates ever. Shauna Hageman, Dr. Wendy Koenig, John Downey, Carlos Ramos, Christina Moorhead, Dr. Colin Williams, and Suman Mondanari. They have represented the faculty well, and I am proud to have served with them this year. I'm also pleased to be able to congratulate Michael Robertson as our new online educational technology coordinator. He teaches anthropology and is an LBCC award-winning online instructor. He has already taken the lead in developing workshops and scheduling trainings that will assist faculty as they continue to teach their classes online. And thank you to Melvin Cobb, whose tenure in this position has come to a close. He will be returning to his computer and office studies department as a faculty member. Congratulations to the Worth the Wait 28, the new faculty cohort, on successfully completing their four-year probationary term. 
welcome to the ranks of tenured faculty. I am proud that many of them have already stepped into leadership roles on campus, and I hope that I will see some of them serving in the Senate very soon. And finally, a very big shout out to the Photogenic 14, this year's new faculty cohort, who have completed their first year as probationary instructors. I was able to pop into a College Culture Friday two weeks ago for a quick visit. They shared with me that they now refer them to themselves as the quarantine 14. Oh my, the stories they will be able to share about their first year at Long Beach City College. I have promised them I would come back and listen. This concludes my report. That was a great report, thank you. I, I, I don't know about the quarantine 14 name. We, we have to come up with something a little more positive. Thank you very much. Item 13-2, Classified Senate President. Cece? Hello. Uh, can you hear me? As usual, Jerry Florence is a hard act to follow. But one thing that she did say that is very important is uh, to stress the importance of the close relationship between the Classified Union, the FAAA, the Faculty Union, the Academic Senate, and the Classified Senate. It's been a pleasure. Uh, so far, as as, I, as long as I've been president, to uh, connect with the four of us together, which is something that hasn't happened in previous years. It's been very important to the culture, and uh, I agree with what Jerry said. Uh, so as far as the Classified Senate, um, we've been doing a lot. And um, one of the things that we've been trying to do, that we have been doing, is Three times a week, we've been having 20 to 40 minute sessions uh, for classified. Uh, we kind of stole the term Coffee Mondays, which is just uh, to have fun. And what we've been doing on Coffee Mondays is uh, one of our members researches, it's the day, uh, national day of, so national jelly bean day or maybe national Star Wars day or something like that. And so we just have fun on those. And then we have Tech Tuesdays. We have uh, many of you know Jonathan Tejada, who's our a uh, help desk uh, person and my colleague we, and uh, Laura Rontala, they've been doing these 20 to 40 minute um, tech Tuesdays, like Microsoft Outlook, Office 365, uh, Skype and things like that. They've been really successful. And then we've been having Wellness Wednesdays, um, which is a place for people to just talk about their struggles uh, and things that they do to make things better, to alleviate anxiety. Um, so that's been really successful. We're going to continue those. Uh, uh, we're uh, proceeding with accreditation and getting more people on the steering committees, and we're happy to be so deeply involved in that process. Um, we have upcoming elections uh, the week of June 8th through 12th. Um, and we have something that's really interesting this year is our statewide organization, which is called 4CS. Uh, normally, we would be going squeezing our budget to send, um, you know, six to 10 people to uh, that conference every year, because we barely have enough budget to cover as many people as we can go. But obviously that was canceled. It was supposed to be in Riverside. And so what they're doing the week of June 8th through 11th is they're having a virtual conference free to any classified member uh, professional throughout the state, classified professional throughout the state. And it's not all day, it's two sessions per day. Uh, and we're very excited about that because it means that uh, anybody can participate and the, they, they usually have very, very good um, programs. And our opening session keynote speaker is Eloy Ortiz Oakley, which is very exciting. So um, going back to classified uh, appreciation week, uh, we want to thank the personnel commission, the board, and Vivian, your wonderful uh, uh, video, the emails, the videos, the social media posts. I, I think it was as much as possible could be done considering um, the situation and we don't get any tacos, but it, we did get a lot of kudos and attention and I, I really thought that was really great. We thank you a lot for that. Um, so we, I think over the course of these, is it eight weeks or 11 weeks or whatever it is, um, people have gone through a roller coaster of anxiety um, to 
being okay to being excited about their work and everybody's kind of settling in. And um, it's been a, a wonderful thing for us to help each other through that anxiety. And I can only speak for myself and maybe a couple of other people that I talk to, but the anxiety now is less working at home and fatigue and Zoom fatigue and things like that. It's more the outside uh, forces. It's more the outside news, the governor, the budget, the, uh, the, the scary things that you read in the news about what might be coming down the line. And so we're trying to help each other with that. And I appreciate so much that the college has been, the college leadership has been uh, as transparent as possible and as creative as possible with trying to alleviate that anxiety, and especially those of us who went through 2008, 2009, and so forth, it was not good. And even Chancellor Oakley has said, uh, we don't want to go through that again. Uh, so maybe the, inter the anxiety is not coming from an internal source now, but it's coming from an external source. So whatever we can do to alleviate that, I, I think we could do that for each other. Uh, thanks a lot. Appreciate that. Thank you, Cece, very much. And I appreciate your the passion with which you shared those experiences, especially the outside forces. We're going to move on to item 13.3 on the agenda, which is uh, Board of Trustees. Uh, these are trustee reports. Any of my colleagues care to report? I can go what's on my screen. Let's see, Trustee Otto, you're first on my screen. You know, I, I'm going to uh, uh, not make a report uh, tonight because uh, it's been a very full meeting. We've got a second closed session uh, followed by a, uh, a brief open session, I think. And uh, so uh, we've all been living through this. It's uh, sort of a little hard to imagine that uh, if somebody would have told me at the beginning of this year that this all would have happened and uh, we'd have to make these adjustments, I would have said, no, 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 no. That, that that doesn't happen but here we are and so uh i'll uh i'll just that's all i'm going to say thank you and uh trustee baxter you are next on my screen okay and I, i'll just talk fast um first of all uh, dario if you put up that um link i would appreciate it uh this last week i attended the jacaranda reception and um, I want to say, uh, this is where you can find uh, all, all the information about Jacaranda. Uh, it is an English essay contest. It was uh, actually started in 1978. Um, the foundation provided the funding and they give cash awards to uh, students and the students are being pulled up right now and winning. And what I want to say about this is I want to recognize the faculty because if you don't have the faculty encouraging students to write well, and, and, and Vivian knows this being a journalist, if you can write, write well and communicate well, you can do anything. Uh, well, maybe not rocket science, but most other things. And so thanks to the faculty for um, encouraging students to apply uh, for this contest. Uh, next to students, because I, I was telling people, and they're probably tired of hearing me say it, but I believe our students are as good as any student at a four-year university. I, I'm talking about Cal, I'm talking about Stanford. The essays that they wrote, and in particular, one young woman, Catherine Colvin, wrote an essay about Richard III that was so fascinating. I, you know, I'm a historian, so I know Richard III, but she's talking about it from, from Shakespeare's point of view, and it was outstanding. And then, of course, the foundation, which provides uh, money for the um, student awards. And so uh, I want to really salute them on that. And then lastly, at, also at the event, um, was the Don Drury Award. And Don Drury was a student at uh, Long Beach City College in the 1930s. He came back as an English professor from 1940s onward. And um, he, uh, his family has raised money to give um, scholarships for students. And so I want to recognize that family for doing that, oh, for the past 30 years. Then I also attended the cap and go, and that was so much fun. I had on my cap and gown and, and got to hand out mortarboards to students. And um, many of them, were, the parents were driving them. Many of them, obviously, they're driving themselves. Their children are in the back seat. 
Uh, they were all excited that they're graduating, and I felt that that was a wonderful activity. And I want to salute uh, Josh Castellanos, who I'm sure was involved in coming together and putting it together. And then the student services, uh, Dr. Munoz area, because I, being formerly in student activities, we know how to put on a program and it was very, very well done. And I want to salute uh, them. Then I attended a CCLC webinar on, um, on the COVID virus and, uh, and different things. It was really interesting. And just a couple of things um, I wanted to point out is they talked about the, and this is, I, talk, I talked before uh, about the nursing program, or all of allied health and the difficulties that our students are having in the entire state of California to get their certifications. Um, I just wrote down 244 hospitals were closed to our nursing and health technology students and, and they will be closed in the fall. And this presents a difficult situation because in order to get their license, they've got to have these clinical hours. And so I really want to salute what the college is doing and working with facilities to try to make sure that our students are taken. And um, then uh, what else did I have? Well, they talked about stu uh, the distance, distance learning support. Uh, and then um, uh, what else have I got here? Can't even read my own handwriting. But anyway, it was a very, very interesting webinar. Um, then I also was on the Rotary, um, the Long Beach Rotary Scholarship Selection Committee uh, for, um, Rotary gives scholarships both to Long Beach City College and to Cal State. I happen to be on the Cal State selection. Um, I uh, was on the Long Beach City College Foundation Executive Committee meeting. Um, then on the Assistance League Scholarships Selection Committee, and one of our Long Beach City College students is getting one of those scholarships. This is a special scholarship for money. And then uh, we had a full uh, Long Beach City College Foundation board meeting last week that uh, um, Superintendent President uh, Bynum spoke to and was very well received. Okay, then lastly, and this is the sad part, I want to close the meeting in memory of three people. And the first one is Dr. Tom Clark. So Jackie, I know you'll know how to spell his name, but Tom Clark was on this board for 16 years and he was a World War II veteran and the war toward the end in 1945. He was a city official, the longest elected official 40 years serving in public office and was a tremendous uh, influence to me and inspiration to me and I know that he will be missed and um, I want to close the meeting in his memory. Then also um, in memory of John McGovern and John McGovern was a facilities manager uh, with the college for, uh, for a number of years. He was in charge of various projects and loved the college and was very, very supportive of our students. And then lastly, and this is very sad, and, and a lot of you may not know this, but uh, Dr. Johnny Mize uh, died yesterday. And Johnny Mize taught philosophy here for 30 some years. Uh, he happens to be Camille Mize, Mize Fulton's father. He was a very distinguished uh, professor, very well liked, um, a wonderful human being, a brilliant, brilliant mind. Uh, uh, wrote books, did all kinds of things. And, and so uh, my heart goes out to all three of the families of those three gentlemen. And if we can close the meeting in their memory, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Baxter. And, and um, I'm glad that you shared all that you just shared during your report. I was planning on calling on you uh, to adjourn the meeting in those names. So now you just made it a little more uh, personal and the public can understand why. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, next on my screen is Trustee Zia. Thank you. Um, I have, I also have a brief report, but um, I just wanted to uh, mention and invite my colleagues um, to join me. I'm so, I've started an effort um, in raising awareness and um, uh, seeking justice for Ahmad. Arbery uh, by the I Run with Maud campaign. For those of you who don't know, on February 23rd, 2020, he, a 25-year-old um, man named Ahmad Arbery was chased and gunned down by Travis McMichael, son of retired Brunswick investigator Greg McMichael, under 
the father's and son's pretenses of witnessing a burglary in Satilla Shores of Glen County in, in Georgia. McMichael's account of the deadly encounter with Aubrey was not released until six weeks after, and of course we had the COVID, um, so it just kind of got buried. Um, and you know, his uh, <laughs> McMichael's questionable account of the events was, uh, um, at the end, the police uh, department's poor communication really following Arbery's death uh, led, uh, led to this petition that is, um, we're trying to get it to a million people signed. We're about 30,000 short. Um, and um, this, the, it's uh, uh, being referred to as a racial profiling and he was a victim of it. And I don't think anybody should <laughs> have the right to pursue attack and kill an unarmed, non-threatening individual. And um, his, his voice should be heard. So every day I've been running 2.23 miles um, in his honor and his memory, um, or 2.23 2, 2 miles. You can run, you can walk, you can jog, whatever su suits your um, appetite in um, the um, you know, wellness realm. Um, and if uh, you could be my partner in that, I'd really appreciate it um, and sign the petition if you can't do the run. Um, and then if we can also add his name and close the meeting um, in his memory as well, I'd appreciate it. And that's all I have. Absolutely, thank you, Trustee Zia. And, and uh, I, I uh, would like to thank you for uh, bringing um, this gentleman's story to light. And also, if I may, um, you know, respectfully add, you know, he's not the only one. So unfortunately, we live in a society right now. I mean, just, you know, this week a gentleman was um, killed, you know, because there was a knee held down to his neck. And, you know, it's happening all over. I'm seeing protests all over. So it's not just him. It's, um, you know, unfortunately dozens of others. And we need to acknowledge that. And I think as an institution, somewhere in our classroom discussions, we need to be uh, sensitive and we need to bring those issues forth and have discussions about that because there are students who face those types of um, threats and we need to make sure that we acknowledge them. Thank you, Trustee Zia. Trustee Untuck? Let me get unmuted there. Hey, uh, thanks. Uh, I was cut off or I, I, I was on mute and I missed it during the uh, Jewish American resolution. I just wanted, I was going to say uh, how I appreciate it coming forward. You know, a lot of times, um, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, diversity and uh, every student matters and uh, making sure we're inclusive of. Uh, uh, you went back on mute. Uh, Trustee Untuck, you're back on mute. Okay. I didn't hit it. Can you, what, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Go back like two sentences. All right. Well, I was trying to say I appreciated the uh, uh, Jewish American resolution that was on the agenda earlier. Um, I think it's important that we have an all student agenda and, and, uh, and being inclusive on campus. And, um, you know, it's uh, in the last, you know, I would say year or so, it's been, you know, heightened anti Semitism and, uh, increase in hate crimes uh, in the community and you know uh, little known fact I, I have Jewish heritage and Jewish family members and have been to Israel uh, multiple times and it's important to me that we uh, recognize uh, the community and have uh, a safe space and um, make sure that we're we're including um, everybody on campus I just wanted to thank the board for that um, I think Dr. Munoz uh, put the resolution together, um, you know, just wanted to, I, I didn't get a chance to say that during the resolution portion earlier. So uh, beyond that, I, uh, I have been working from home for about three months. Uh, I have gone to no events. <laughs> I have taught no classes, um, but uh, been staying engaged and following things and uh, hope everyone is uh, staying safe. Um, you know, with their masks and social distance and, and uh, washing their hands. Um, we, you know, we, we are being especially cautious because uh, we do have some, I have some family members who are high risk uh, category. And I think for our, our student body, 
uh, there has been the false notion that younger people were immune or did not or could not get uh, COVID, and um, but they may be a silent carrier. They may not have symptoms, but have um, you know on their arm or in their hand or a, a doorknob or something they have touched. So it's uh, important that we continue to um, practice um, social distancing and remind our student body how important it is for all of us to be careful because, um, you know, you don't want to inadvertently um, get someone who's older and high or in a high risk category that you don't even know they're in a high risk category, to get them sick. Um, and it's, you know, we're, I know that the conversations are starting about opening up. I think it's too soon. I don't think the health and the science uh, are driving the reopenings. Uh, and I'm concerned that we were open too quickly. Uh, you went uh, potentially, yep, there you go. I saw it. Potentially, uh, you know, creating a second wave of uh, exposure because we do know the uh, virus mutates and changes. And it's a different kind of virus on the East Coast of New York that went through Europe versus the West Coast version. And I think they've identified eight or nine different versions of the coronavirus. And so, um, you know, if you're looking at the 1918 uh, Spanish flu, it was a second wave that was more deadly and had mutated uh, and was different. So, you know, until we get a real vaccine or a therapy, um, you know, it's, it's going to be very difficult to go back to normal. And, uh, you know, I know it's been incredibly challenging for faculty and staff and administrators to, you know, work from home and teach online and completely upend our lives. But it's, uh, you know, people's lives are at stake and it's uh, not normal. And, you know, we said not planned. Uh, there was, you know, pandemic preparation efforts there. We've known that global pandemics were a risk. Uh, unfortunately, you know, as a country, we were not prepared for it, but uh, that doesn't mean we can't take, you know, appropriate steps now and, and in the coming months to, to try to mitigate and minimize exposure. So I just wanted to close on, on that note. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Trustee Antuck, and I, I like the what you mentioned about the second wave of the influenza in 1918. Um, I actually read an article about that this weekend, so I, I wish more people would be aware of that. Okay, so I do have a few items to report. Um, so one of the things that at the beginning of COVID, um, I was really sad because, um, like, kind of, but not really sad, you know, one of those low-key sad, when I would open up my calendar and I kept having to cancel events, and I was, you know, all these events were being canceled, and I found myself having all this time, which was great. And one thing that's happened in the last maybe month or so is all of a sudden now there's those events are coming back. People are becoming more creative with their use of technology and their use of, um, you know, gathering remotely or doing different things. So my calendar is starting to fill up again. Um, since our last board meeting, I have attended several Zoom meetings on campus with different groups, and um, I, I believe it was last week. I can't remember. The days are all kind of blending, but I uh, had an enjoyable meeting with AFT, our classified staff, during one of their meetings. I think it was, um, I don't know if it was a, an e-board meeting or if it was a, a regular membership meeting. I don't think so. It seemed too small to be a regular membership meeting. But I enjoyed having that opportunity. And earlier in the month, I'd seen a post from classified staff members who had shared the screen of their Zoom meeting. And I was so impressed by that, uh, the fact that they're still able to meet. Um, I know that the US Surgeon General had mentioned, and I think I may have said this before, that uh, social, distance, social distancing does not mean social disengagement. So I think it's very important, especially for all the different groups on campus to continue meeting that way. Even though we can't meet in person and even though we can't have that human contact, at least we're able to continue with the work and we're still able to meet remotely and get our um, opinions and views and our goals shared with the public. Okay, so coming up, um, I'm sorry, I'm jumping the gun here. On May 12th, I had an opportunity to participate in an, a higher education town hall that was hosted by Assemblymember Patrick O'Donnell. 
And um, I was on a panel with a representative from Cal State Long Beach, as well as Los Angeles Harbor College. And we were able to respond to questions that had previously been submitted. And it was interesting to hear uh, what the other institutions are doing to mitigate COVID and to continue with education. And it made me very proud to represent this college because, you know, bar none, we've done more than anybody else. And I can say that freely, especially after hearing some of the reports, as I know that we've done a lot. So I'm very proud of that. Um, the uh, an, Another thing that uh, there's been a lot of, and I'm going to plug our virtual commencement, our first ever virtual commencement on June 12th. If you're a student and you haven't registered to participate in our virtual commencement, you are going to miss out on a beautiful ceremony, historic ceremony. And for those of you who have already participated, you know how much work the communications team is putting into making this virtual ceremony happen. I, excuse me, I had an appointment a couple of weeks ago to come and say a few words that would be recorded and um, edited into the video. And I was blown away when I walked into the studio room in the H building because it looked like I was actually at the graduation. It looked like commencement was happening with the background, the lights, the props. I mean, it was just outstanding. So this is a video that you will want to keep, that you will want to reference, and that you will want to share with your families. And again, I want to give kudos to the communications team for making that happen. Um, I don't want to leave anybody out, but I know that um, Josh, Stacy, Camille, Gabby, Jerome, Brad, and there were also um, members of our radio and film department there on hand. So thank you very much for what you're doing. I look forward to the video. And while I'm talking about communications, have you seen this? Have you seen the campus community newsletter? Have you seen the images of the uh, Zoom meetings happening. This is one to keep. This is a keeper. And I just want to say that uh, all of our employees are doing an outstanding job with their COVID time because look at all these virtual backgrounds. Everybody's traveling and going to all these wonderful places. And in this month's um, uh, campus community newsletter, I know Ms. Bina mentioned earlier the awards that we received. I was really happy to see Mang on there, one of our students who was recognized, he had been recognized previously um, for his effort in the Cambodian community. This is a really big deal, these marketing awards. And I just want to make sure that everybody understands that um, we have to make sure that all the good work that the college is doing gets out there. And that's been one of my efforts because so many people were doing so many wonderful things before and we hardly ever heard about it. So we're, we're very happy to get that information out. Um, as uh, Superintendent President Bynum mentioned, I was appointed to uh, the LA County community. Um, it was a county task force on the economic recovery. And uh, there are different subgroups. And I was appointed by Supervisor Janice Hahn to represent the labor group and we've already began working and um, we have some um, procedures and suggestions that we are going to actually we have a zoom meeting on friday about this and this is something that we hope that all employees throughout the county are able to integrate into their operations in terms of safety measures with disinfecting and returning to work and once the economy opens back up we want to be sure that um, everyone contributes and there are lots of other um, representatives of labor on that committee. I believe there's 15 or 16 of us, and it is headed by um, Mr. Ron Herrera, who's the current president of the LA County Federation of Labor. So we are definitely in good company. Um, also coming up, we have a lot of Zoom banquets. It's the season, it's the end of the year when we celebrate the hard work of our students. So, you know, Trustee Baxter, was I pronouncing it wrong all these years? I, you know, I speak Spanish, so we say jacaranda. And I heard you say well, that that's you're right. That's a, the Spanish pronunciation, but they call it jacaranda. OK, like, so you are I've correct. always said jacaranda, so I you are correct. Able, OK, I was not able to make the jacaranda annual event this year. I had a conflict in my schedule with another Zoom meeting, but I really want to commend our faculty member, English professor Jason. Um, Kasim, who just is doing just an outstanding job. And I hope I didn't mispronounce that, but is it Kasim or Kasim? 
Um, just really proud of the work that you're doing with our students. And I look forward to attending uh, some of these year end closing activities. And I'm gonna tell you guys a secret. I could never be in two places at one time before COVID, but thanks to COVID, Zoom makes it possible. As long <laughs> as you've got two laptops and two cell phones, you can actually swing being in two places at once or at least, you know, really relatively close in time. And tomorrow I'll be participating in an education town hall. Trustee Untuck and I will be representing um, higher ed again. So uh, that's another opportunity that we have to engage in our community. And lastly, I just wanna share a photo there. Dario, if you have that photo queued up. Uh, last week, we were at the grab and go event, which was tons and tons of fun. And we got to distribute cap and gown um, and gifts. As was mentioned earlier, I'd like to commend again, um, the communications team and really Dr. Munoz because um, Vice President Munoz has really gone out of his way um, I've talked to other people at other institutions and they're not doing half as much as we're doing, but you know, LBCC has always been kind of extra and we always do a little bit more. And I'm so proud of the work Dr. Munoz and his student services team, they, you know, they were able to produce this grab and go. And I don't know if you recognize that Oli, but it's the same Oli that kind of makes appearances at our um, parades, but that's my son. And, you know, I was looking at pictures at the beginning of the year and now Oli has grown. Oli had a growth spurt this year. So he, there, he's getting taller. So I don't know how much longer I'm going to get him to be able to be Oli, but uh, that was us at the grab and go event. Other than that, I just want to congratulate everybody on getting through this semester. By the time we meet in June, uh, it'll be a wrap and commencement would have happened and enjoy the end of the semester. Good luck with finals and all the activities that we have prepared. And we will cyber see you all for commencement. Thank you, everybody. And that is my report. 13-4 uh, on the agenda. Do we have any trustee committee reports? No. All right. And 13-5, any future reports? This is the opportunity for board members to request additional reports for future board agendas with consensus of the board and consideration by the superintendent president. None? Okay, so section 14 on the agenda. Any public comments on non-agenda items? None, Madam Secretary. You're on mute, but I can read lips. You said no. All right, and now we are going into our second closed session. I have a question just out of respect for the um, executive vice president's time. Uh, does anybody need to stick around for the second closed session? Um, other than Superintendent President Bynum. Is there anybody else who needs to stick around or? Well, you said you were gonna finish negotiations and that includes- That's right. So that's right. So we'll stick around for that one. And then perhaps after we conclude that agenda item, then um, maybe, you know- yeah, the other two do not need the trustees. I mean, the VPs, the last two items. Correct. So, so in our second closed session, we are going to pick up where we left off with, um, let's see, item 1.5 we didn't complete, which was LBCCFA negotiation. And then we will pick up, uh, start with, actually begin 1.6 anew. We have not spoken about that, which is conference with our labor negotiator. And um, 1.7, anticipated litigation. Uh, once we conclude those two and a half items, then I will come back to report out. And, and you need to uh, in. you need to approve 5.1 after you have your closed session. Correct. Oh, that's right. We will come back after our second closed session for item 5.1. Thank you for reminding us of that. Right. So Everybody we'll be taking here at home. <laughs> well, Thank you. Have a good night. Karen? Hopefully, hopefully it'll be quick. Yes. I'll be here. Will I <laughs> need to be there as well?
Okay, good evening, everyone. The time is 11.57 p.m. And uh, we have to, um, we're not done with our second closed session, but because the board meeting has to be adjourned before midnight and then restarted again after midnight, it's a, a Brown Act and, um, you know, public meeting rule. So uh, we're going to report out on item 1.5 and item 1.6. No, I'm sorry. We'll report out on, did I say that right? Yeah, 1.5 yeah. and 1.6. And then we still have to address item 1.7, but we will do that after midnight in a new meeting. Same meeting continuation. Okay. At this time, Trustee Baxter, would you care to adjourn the, this meeting right now? Um, I know that you'd already given some background on the three members of the public that you wanted to adjourn, so we already heard that. But if you want to adjourn the meeting in their name, we can do that. And then everybody just stand by, and I will call the meeting to order again shortly after midnight. So, do I just say I move to adjourn the meeting? Sure, and you can mention uh, the names. I, I move to adjourn the meeting of May 27th. Mm -hmm. In, in honor of... Oh, I'm sorry, in memory of Dr. Tom Clark, uh, Mr. John McGovern, and Dr. Johnny Mice. Okay, thank you very and much. Also, uh, uh, Ahmaud Arbery. Oh, and Ahmaud Arbery. And yeah. Ahmaud Arbery. Yes. Okay, and I'm sorry, um, Board Council Vincent, do, do we need to report out before I officially adjourn on 1.5 and 1.6? The, the, the order doesn't matter. You can report out after. Okay, got it. Okay, so it is 11.59 p.m. We are temporary, we're adjourning this meeting um, and then everybody just stand by for a second. As soon as the clock that I'm going by, which is at the corner of my laptop, hits midnight, then I'll restart the meeting all over again. Um, events, did the this a reconvening when, when we start the new or is it all a start over? So it, it would be reconvening. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Did you get a second to that motion? Uh, to what motion? To adjourn. To adjourn. No, I did not. I didn't. I'll second it. Okay. Uh, moved by Trustee Baxter, second by Trustee Zia. Any discussion? All in favor? All Aye. in favor. Uh, Aye. Roll call vote, please. Uh, Virginia Baxter? Aye. Uh, Viv uh, Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduwak Joe Entuck? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. And Sunny Zia? Aye. Okay, motion passes. Meeting was adjourned, and uh, it is now after midnight, so just in the interest of time and everybody being super tired. Uh, this is a record for me. I know that uh, there has been another board meeting that went after midnight, but this is a record for me. So now I would like to reconvene the regularly scheduled board meeting of Wednesday, May 27, 2020 of the Long Beach Community College District Board of Trustees. We are going into our second closed session to hear one item, that is item 1.7, which is anticipated litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9 D2, conference with legal counsel, Alvarez, Glassman and Colvin, and it is just one case. So if you're still watching, I can't imagine why, because you could just watch it on YouTube tomorrow in daylight. But if you're still watching, uh, hopefully we will be brief and we will be back. Thank you. And now our meeting hosts will move us over into um, the, sec the third closed session, I guess. So um, does camera stay return when you come back in? Because you have that yes. light. Okay, thank you. We'll be reporting out. Okay, I'm leaving this room, going to the other one.
Okay, everyone, good evening. It is 12.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And um, for those of you that are still with us, thank you. We don't understand why, but we appreciate you. Thank you to our staff who is hanging in there. We apologize for the very lengthy meeting tonight. Um, we are reconvening our third closed session. It's really the second, but we had to adjourn the meeting uh, before midnight. Uh, because of Brown Act rules, and then we had to reconvene again right after midnight. So this is why this is our third closed session. We do have some items to report out on. On item 1.5, we did uh, give the board direction. I'm sorry, we gave staff direction. On item 1.6, this is... Um, Actually, we we are going to address that in item 5.1. Is that correct, Board Council Vincent Ewing? So uh, the action will actually happen in item 5.1, correct? Yes. Okay, got it. And item 1.7 is uh, we established an ad hoc committee and we gave um, our Board Council direction. Correct? Okay, so now we're gonna, that's our reporting out on closed session items. So now we are going back to the one item that was tabled, which is item 5.1. And this is amended employment contract for interim superintendent president, Luann Bynum. So I will open that up to my colleagues on the board. Hey, uh, President Malula. Um, May, I'd like to just make a motion to adopt the uh, draft that's on the agenda. Okay, we've got a motion to adopt the draft on the agenda for the public. Um, and, and I hope I'm articulating this correctly, but we are extending the term by six months with an additional compensation package. Is that correct? Yes. Is it correct? It, doesn't it say what it is? Yes, it does. Um, I'm, I just wanna make sure that I'm saying the right thing. So the recommended action is that the Board of Trustees approve the amended employment contract for interim superintendent president Luann Bynum as submitted. The initial contract was approved for a six month term commencing March 14th, 2020 and ending September 14th, 2020 with a total compensation of $120,000 plus health and welfare benefits and life insurance. The amended employment contract provides for a term extension effective May 27, which was yesterday before midnight, 2020 and ending March 14th, 2021 with an increase based on annual compensation of 288,000 plus health and welfare benefits and life insurance. We have a motion by trustee Untuck. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on this item? Yeah, I, I'd like to say um, something, trustee Malalu. Yes, go ahead, trustee Zia. Uh, I just want to say that um, I support the, super, the interim superintendent president. I think she's um, done a good job. Um, you know, we did negotiate with her two months ago. And, um, you know, while I support her um, and I'm not opposed to extending the term of the contract for six months, but I think it would be more appropriate for us uh, because we're in this economic misery and pandemic to be considering a salary increase at that time based on an evaluation, a performance evaluation as we've done previously for our superintendent presidents and the interims. And I just think it sends the wrong message to give a 20% increase two months into the contract again, during a pandemic and economic misery. Um, and if the ask, uh, you know, it sounds like the motion is to give a 20% increase. Um, and I will not be able to support that as much as I support the superintendent. Have we if we were to defer this um, closer to the six month timeline and assess it back the, at that time, um, I'm certainly willing to evaluate that and assess that based on a performance evaluation. But I just don't think um, it, it's uh, prudent for me to vote in favor of it um, 
given the circumstances that's presented itself before us. Okay, would anybody else like to weigh in? Yeah, I would. Um, so um, I've done what we did when we appointed Luann Bynum as the interim uh, uh, superintendent president was we did it on the uh, in a rush and with out really considering or any information as to about uh, as to what salaries were uh, and uh, I've done a, a a comprehensive look at at comparable Southern California community college districts including Citrus Chafee Santa Monica Pasadena Mount Sac Glendale and Cerritos and um, based on that and conversations with any number of superintendent presidents, chancellors, and others who are active in this field, um, I think that it is only fair that we pass this resolution, uh, or, or rather that we, that we amend this contract and extend it. Uh, I think that um, there's, no, there's no market for community college presidents right now because of the pandemic and what's going on in the country it would be extremely hard uh, the, the the chancellor at the university of california the uh, the uh, head of the csus both decided to stay in place because of what's going on here it wasn't about money it was about what's on, going on in the market i think the likelihood that we would be able to find the kind of superintendent president that we need at Long Beach City College uh, before next spring is, is, is highly, highly unlikely and to rush into it would be a bad idea. That's the motivation for extending the contract. Besides the fact that we've got so much stuff going on here now, not only finishing the semester, but getting off to a good start. We've got labor negotiations that are going on. Um, and uh, and so I think that the extension is almost should go without saying. It just becomes a question of compensation. And um, the uh, the the twenty four thousand dollars per month that uh, is suggested here would put us uh, in the eight community colleges that are comparable in Southern California. In other words, with comparable uh, enrollments, uh, budgets, and the like, uh, we would be number uh, uh, six of eight. So we're way, way down. We would be uh, uh, five thousand, more than $5,000 less per month than um, uh, other, uh, other colleges on this list. I think that um, we've seen uh, the job that uh, Superintendent President Bynum has done since she's been here. You heard what uh, Jerry Florence, the head of the Academic Senate, and C.C. Sadler, the head of the, uh, the uh, Classified Senate, said last at our last meeting about how good it was to, wonderful it was to work with her, how open she was, how she understood the institution, and, uh, and so uh, that's why I seconded it and I support the recommendation. President Malulu, can I say something? Yes. Um, I think um, Superintendent President Bynum is the right person at the right time. She has come in uh, at 100%, which the average interim could not do. And the reason she could do that is because of her history of the college, her understanding of the people who are here. And uh, so I support this um, proposal. Okay, um, any, anybody else, Trustee Antec? I know that was your motion. Um, I, um, go ahead, Trustee Antec, I see that you unmuted. No, I was gonna say, I, I know in discussions it was, you know, her previous salary was nearly identical to the current salary um, at a lower level position. And to me, it makes sense to, to give a little bit of cushion there. Um, you know, I know there's compression issues with other, you know, people you're supervising, they're very close. Um, you know, it's, 
well, and me on a percent basis, let's say, oh, 20%, you know, we're, we're talking about a couple thousand dollars here, you know. So, I mean, I'm, I'm open to hear what other folks have to say. Well, I think I'm the only one left that needs to weigh in on this, and I'm just going to reiterate what has already been stated, uh, what I what I previously said on the issue, and I'm, I'm going to speak directly to Luann when I say this. Um, I agree that you are the right person for the job, absolutely, and I think that your 20 years of service to the college prior to you being named, uh, appointed as interim, definitely has a lot of value and brings a lot to the table. I have no problem extending your contract. I have no problem increasing the amount um, of your salary. I don't have a problem with that. I think you deserve it. Um, and I think it's justified because, you know, I know we're not going to have a new superintendent president in place um, by the time the fall semester begins or even midway. So for sure, I'm pretty sure you'll be with us longer. However, I do have a problem with approving this extension and increase in salary tonight. And the reason is because we had a very lengthy budget presentation. We had a very lengthy discussion. Um, it was very grim, very bleak. Um, it, it looked awful. And we've got negotiations with our faculty right now. Um, two very impassioned uh, experiences were shared by our faculty members. Um, in addition to uh, the discussion that we had with regard to the ongoing negotiation. Um, just as I believe that you are deserving of the extension and the increased salary, I equally believe that faculty is deserving as well. And I wanna make sure that we make the faculty whole and that we make you whole, but we have to, we can't be hypocrites about it. We can't talk out of both sides of our mouth. We can't say, no, we don't have the money for faculty, but then we have money for you. We can't do that. We, we have to be able to do both and take care of both at the same time. And Trustee Otto brought up a lot of really good points. Um, and, and this is not knocking you at all, but in comparison to other superintendent presidents, they're not interims. And they also have advanced degrees. And, and it's just the comparison is not 100% equitable. So I want to make sure that um, you're taken care of and that we do it the right way, but I, I want to be fair and I want to be able to, um, in essence, protect the integrity of the negotiations that we have and the finances and the resources that we have, both with our ongoing negotiation and you as well. So I would actually like to propose an amendment to this. Um, Trustee Untuck, if you're open for a friendly amendment that we table this till next month, we revisit it. Um, you know, we, we've got some budget issues that were talked about today. And um, Luann, you mentioned that you were going to direct staff to look at some contracts and to look at some um, um, consulting uh, vendors. So let's look at that. And, and again, this is absolutely in no way knocking the job that you've done you're perfect for this position. I'd be happy if you were with us longer. I'd be happy to increase the contract and increase the amount. I just don't think it's, you know, you know, we've, we've used the word optics today. I just don't think the optics of that would be good. Um, you definitely deserve it, and I'm pretty sure you'll get it, but let, let's not put the cart before the horse, and let's take care of what we have on the table. And then I'd be happy to come back and revisit that. Um, so, Trustee Untucked, are you open to an amendment or that we table this until next month? Or, and it's your it's your motion. I, you know, we, we, we spoke in closed session about it, but uh, Luann wasn't there. I don't know if there's anything she wants to say. Um, well, I appreciate everybody um, addressing this and... Um, trying to deal with it. I understand that this is a really, really hard time. I mean, if you had to pick a time to have this topic come up, you couldn't have picked probably a worse time. Um, I wish at the beginning when I came on board, it would have been a little more thoughtful. Um, even from my own side, I didn't have enough time really to take a look at what pay was and try to figure it out. Um, I don't think you did as a board either. Um, you had, you know, you were in, um, you know, urgently trying to get somebody in place. I would hope that you'd recognize that what 
we would do with an extension and the extra salary um, is value what I'm bringing to the table right now. Because, you know, I also don't think it's a normal time for anybody to step into a college in an interim basis and take over. Um, I never dreamed that I would start um, a job on a Saturday night and then be shutting down a campus on Monday night, um, much less walking into bargaining with um, two um, bargaining groups and um, on top of that, having a state budget crisis that ends up being worse than what we faced in the recession. And all those things have come together um, in a, a, a perfect storm, I guess, if you will, um, for the next few months and the next few years. I love Long Beach City College. I would love to um, stay and help you out with the transition and work through it, but um, it is an issue for me. I mean, I'm, I'm making $700 more a month right now than I was making when I left in 2017. And, um, you know, I came out of retirement for this, but um, I would just ask that you consider that, you know, it's, it's that, you know, you, you are the board and you make the decisions and I'll, um, I'll live with that and that's fine, but um, I do appreci appreciate you considering it. Can I, uh, can I say something? Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and I, I think it's a false comparison to compare what we're talking about with the faculty and uh, where we're talking about millions and millions of dollars with con new contracts and, and we're all very supportive of the faculty and we want to help them in one, any way we can. I think those sentiments have been shared. What we're talking about here in this proposed contract extension is for over the course of a year, 40,000 more dollars. That's all it is. Um, that's uh, chunk change and we ought not to be worried about that. I think we've made, I, I've made a clear case without going into all the details in this open session about what it is that other uh, superintendent presidents make. I have talked to three separate people who have said that interims oftentimes make more than, uh, than superintendent presidents because they come in under tough circumstances and they're asked to do uh, uh, job. Uh, uh, Rose Delgadio, who was our vice president for human resources, uh, took an interim position down in San Diego at Southwestern College for $350,000 a year. Uh, you know, it's almost an insult to not do this, given the feelings that everybody is expressing about, uh, about the job that Luann is doing and um, what she can do for us over the, as, as we move on to a more permanent position with somebody else. So I, I feel very strongly about it. I almost feel that to, to question this and what, or to want to put it off as an insult. Yeah, I, I remember, um, I'm aware of um, Rose uh, taking that position at Southwest. She went in shortly after the one of our previous finalists left Southwest, so she had a lot of cleaning up to do. Um, so whatever is the pleasure of the board, um, you know, uh, we do have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Yeah, I, I seconded it. Okay, you're right. We have a motion by Trustee Untuck and a second by Trustee Otto. We've had the discussion. And Madam Secretary, if you would just please take a roll call vote. Uh, uh, Vivian? Yes. You, you had mentioned a friendly amendment, but you never said what it was. Well, um, I'm, I did, but just not officially. I mean, I just, you know, <laughs> you know, Luann, I, everything you said is, is spot on. I mean, I, and everything everybody else said is spot on. It's just, we've got, you know, we've got millions of people unemployed right now. And with the pandemic and the uncertainty that so many people are facing and, and, you know, there's a, I believe it's like a three point something percent tax increase that's going to be coming down in Long Beach. And there's, I just, I think I, I would like to amend that we hold off if, if that can even be done, if that's a, an appropriate amendment, if we table this until next month, amend your motion to approve it next month to table it um, and just, you know, finish what we had already had started. 
Um, I'm so tired right now. I don't even know if that that amendment makes sense. Would be to table the the motion. It'd be a motion. Okay. So I, I would like to propose a friendly amendment that we table this um, extension and increase until the next regularly scheduled board meeting, and that we revisit it at that time. Um, and again, Luann, I, I can't tell you enough. You definitely you deserve it. I, I would even consider the possibility of making it retroactive. Uh, just, you know, there's so many different avenues that we can pursue, but you're right. You know, this, this is kind of a hairy time right now to be doing that. And, and look at, I mean, just a couple hours ago, we were having a very heated discussion about the budget and how, how bad things are. So come, come back to us next month and show us where we're going to trim the fat with some of these consulting contracts. And you know, well, Madam President, where is the second to your amendment? Oh, I, I don't think there, I don't know. Is there a second to my amendment? It's so it works. Okay, so it dies for lack of a second. So now we do have the motion and the second to approve this um, extension. Madam Secretary, if you would take roll. Well, I'm sorry, roll call vote and you're on mute, Jackie. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malauulu. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say nay tonight. Uduak Joe Intuck. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. And Sunny Zia. Nay. Okay, motion carries. I'll, I'll give a response like Vivian. <laughs> okay, well, the motion carries. So, um, Luann, you. You, you got a raise and a contract extension tonight. Congratulations. Uh, I hope we are able to do the same for the rest of our employees in the, in the next couple of weeks and we can make everybody whole and, um, you know, really do something worthy with that, with the budget that we have before us. Uh, okay. I just, I just want to say thank you. Um, I understand that it's tough to make these kinds of decisions, but I do appreciate it. So thank you. Okay, is there anything else that we need to do before we officially adjourn? Everybody's just gonna hit the floor right now. Okay, so once again, I just wanna say thank you to our staff, Jackie, our board secretary, Dario. I know that there are other people uh, with IT um, hanging in there with us. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it is 12.52 in the morning. We're moving on to section 16, which is the adjournment, 16.1. The next regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Trustees will be held on Wednesday, June 24th, 2020. Closed session will begin at 4.30, open session at 5.30. Thank you again, and Jackie, for records, 12.53 in the morning. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. I got it. Yay. Good Thank you. Thank you. Everybody.